friends, and welcome to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. We're happy to have you here with us for the public seminar on poverty and child stunting. To formally begin our seminar, may I call on our president, Dr. Celia Reyes, for her opening remarks. Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Um, welcome you to PIDS. We're very glad that um, you can attend today's session because this is something that's uh, very important, poverty and child stunting. And um, we all know that poverty, despite all the uh, economic growth we've been experiencing, is still relatively high. Um, although recently we've had good news that the Based on the latest report of the Philippine Statistics Authority, poverty incidence has actually gone down during the first half of 2018 compared to the first half of 2015. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Albert will elaborate on this, but the data um, is that from 27.6% in 2015, the poverty incidence among Filipino individuals in the first semester of 2018 um, has gone down to 21 percent. That's among individuals. And then in terms of families, um, in 2015 it was 22.2 percent, and then by the first half of 2018, it has gone down to 16 percent. Um, although um, probably Dr. Albert uh, will share, explain a little bit uh, that there were some. Um, changes also in in um, in the data collection instruments. Uh, this decreasing figures, however, does not mean that we should be um, very happy or complacent. Many Filipinos still face vulnerability to, to poverty due to various factors. And this afternoon, our very own uh, senior research fellow, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert will present a study that he has conducted which estimates the vulnerability level of households to poverty and provides forward-looking interventions to build their resilience to prevent or reduce the likelihood of experiencing poverty in the future. And he'll also be um, presenting um, his other work on multidimensional poverty index. Um, an equally important topic is child stunting and the data, recent data that we have shows that it has not really changed or improved or decreased significantly over the last few years. In fact, the data shows that the prevalence of stunting is uh, stood at 30 in 2013, went up to 33 in 2015, and then in 2018, um, it has, it's back to 30. So um, I'm sure um, our presenter will explain this uh, trend uh, because our resource speaker on child uh, stunting this afternoon is um, somebody very familiar to, I think, to most of us, Dr. Alejandro Herin. He's our expert on uh, <laughs> nutrition, among other things. <laughs> Um, and uh, he will, for this afternoon, he will present the study he co-authored with a, a PIDS research fellow on the role of local government units in the delivery of maternal, neonatal, and child health care healthcare services in, in communities. And the study suggests ways on how to improve governance, health systems, and nutrition programs at the local level. Um, this is also our way of supporting um, the National Nutrition Month, as you all know, we celebrate uh, National Nutrition Month every July. And that's why we are, um, our ID, our research information department has chosen this topic for, for this month. So on this note, I'd like to thank everyone for um, coming over this afternoon and I hope we could have a fruitful discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Ma'am Sel. Our first presenter this afternoon is a senior research fellow here at the PIDS. He served as a uh, secretary general to the then National Statistical Coordination Board. He is a professional statistician who has written topics on poverty measurement and analysis, education statistics, agricultural statistics, climate change, survey design, data mining and statistical analysis of missing data. Friends, let us all welcome Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. Uh, 
thank you, Wang. Good uh, afternoon. Uh, this study, that uh, the first study that I'll be presenting is uh, uh, discussed estimates mentioned by Dr. Reyes of vulnerability to poverty based on a methodology that uh, uses data from cross-section surveys. Uh, the talk is structured in such a way that we will first justify why this is important. Uh, uh, we, we point out that poverty reduction should involve assessing not only poverty itself, which is measured exposed, uh, but also vulnerability, which involves risks to future poverty. Uh, we describe an approach that to estimating household vulnerability to income, uh, yielding estimates of vulnerability. And finally, we discuss the, some policy implications, uh, uh, public interventions usually directed at helping those who have been identified that, uh, as poor, but government really needs to broaden its, its scope of assessments, uh, taking into account dynamics of poverty uh, in public policy and helping uh, the needy. You know? Uh, the reduction of poverty continues to be central to socioeconomic development, whether nationally or globally, and this is reflected in our Philippine Development Plan and uh, the worldwide commitment to attain the Sustainable Development Goals. Assessments have largely focused on the measurement and monitoring of uh, poverty, which is exposed, uh, yet there is recognition that poverty is dynamic, uh, poor households might, might be likely to stay poor uh, if there are no interventions, but non-poor households, especially those near the poverty line, might be at risk of becoming few poor in the future. Uh, panel data from 2003 to 2009 that uh, Dr. Reyes and I examined uh, in many different instances shows that among the near poor, uh, those, for instance, with incomes less than 1.5 times the official poverty threshold, in 2003, three out of 10 fell into poverty by six years later. No? So in other words, we know that you, you have people moving in and out of poverty. And so this is, uh, needs to be looked into and given policy attention. While information on who is poor today should be a good guide uh, about those who will be poor in the future, but this will be only a good guide, I should say, if people are persistently poor. Uh, however, we do note that there are people moving in and out of poverty, and uh, even during periods in between 2003 and 2009, and even all the way to 2012, uh, where you did not have, um, where gross poverty did not change much, uh, we will note that the reason why there was no change was because some, the, the proportions in poverty, uh, th some people may have gotten out of poverty, but some people moved back in, move, moved into poverty. So uh, we need to recognize that poverty is like a disease. It carries a stigma and it re requires interventions, but approaches to poverty have been largely curative, uh, uh, meaning we've always been looking at alleviations of the, condi alleviating conditions of the poor or helping them exit poverty, just like treating the sick. But we also need to recognize that there's a need for preventive policies, protecting particularly those vulnerable from the risks and harmful effects of poverty by building the resilience of the vulnerable, just like enabling those who are at risk of si sickness from having uh, from, uh, from these uh, problems of, of sickness, no? of uh, making sure that they will have better chances of not falling into sickness. So thus, in, in our study, uh, we, we aim to actually estimate uh, the proportion of vulnerable households uh, in the period between, well, well, from 2003 all the way to 2015 and looking at trends. Also profile uh, households that are vulnerable to income poverty, uh, uh, giving special attention to the, their demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. And as I said, discuss uh, policy issues in the wake of the need to build resilience uh, to welfare risks for households communi and communities. Now, the term vulnerability connotes many things and has been measured in various ways. In this study, we adopt an, an, what's known as an expected poverty approach based on work by Chudhuri that uh, essentially tries to estimate the probability of households falling into poverty. Um, 
in the future. No? And we did we, uh, do some previous work on this, uh, monitoring vulnerability using uh, cross-section data, but as well as also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, panel data, uh, particularly way back, you know, as er, tw even 20 years ago when we did have panel data between the FIES and the APs, now some households being interviewed in, in both surveys. Uh, and then recently, uh, Dr. Reyes and I, whether jointly or separately, have been looking at this panel data between 2003 and 2009. But at the same time, we, I, I did work uh, with, with, with some of my uh, research assistants and so with uh, Dr. Reyes, uh, with her own associates, uh, to look into uh, examining um, vulnerability from a cross-section perspective. Um, and the literature, uh, this framework that I'm showing is really quite helpful uh, because we know that uh, households are generally very heterogeneous there may we could cluster them into interrelated socioeconomic dimensions of income assets and capabilities and we know that there are key shocks and uh, sources of vulnerability affecting households including uh, those relating to labor and employment shocks for instance if a household that loses uh, or how or how uh, the breadwinner of the household would lose a job or uh, for instance price shocks uh, spikes in food prices or maybe even demographic, uh, reproductive and health-related re shocks, such as the death of a household member, um, or shocks from natural disasters, whether in the form of cost to livelihood or loss of life and assets. So in this study, we, uh, we continued our previous work that essentially, as I said, tries to uh, predict the chance of a household falling into poverty uh, using what's known as a... Uh, uh, a probit model, a modified prob probit model that was developed by Choudhury that was first uh, applied to in an uh, Indonesian expenditure data. So we here we used income data from the FIES, uh, modeling uh, the, the, uh, the household characteristics such as employment, education, location, uh, dwelling characteristics, uh, experience in price surges, experience of severe st storms, uh, and uh, using the resulting estimates of the probability of, of a household falling into poverty, we then classified households as being vulnerable if their chances of being poor would exceed the national poverty rate, or um, otherwise, no? to, uh, being non-vulnerable. Then further, if you're vulnerable, you could be either highly vulnerable if your chance is of being poor is more than 50%. Whereas uh, if your chance is between the national poverty rate and 50%, then you're considered relatively vulnerable. So, uh, but just to convince ourselves this, that this approach is going to work, we actually first tested this out on panel data to try to figure out whether this uh, modeling approach is is actually going to work. So we, if we're looking at the vulnerability of panel data in 2003, and then try to look through what would happen to them uh, by 2009, we note that uh, we're able to, to actually observe, in particular, that we have very strong predictive power, and that gave us, um, for instance, just to, just to illustrate, um, uh, let's see, among households, in 2006 and 2009, 60% uh, were considered highly vo uh, vulnerable and 35% relatively vulnerable in 2003. So it seems we're able to fairly predict uh, the poverty status in 2006 and 2009 uh, from the characteristics in 2003. Similarly, when you're looking at, uh, for instance, what, what, was, what was the vulnerability status in 2003, um, you know, half of the households were considered highly vulnerable, where in fact uh, fell into poverty in both 2006 and 2009, and some of them even may have uh, been poor in one year or another. So we are we we having convinced ourselves that this seems to work fairly well. Uh, we we then started uh, uh, looking at the approach for identifying the future poverty. Uh, vulnerability status across all the years from 2003 all the way to 2015 
and uh, then we examined what would what were the, the, the trends in vulnerability um, and we had noticed that uh, while it's very clear that the proportion of households that are being tagged as vulnerable is around double to triple the corresponding official poverty estimates, which seem to be very similar to the estimates, I think, of Mahar for self-rated poverty. They're very, very much higher than, than, uh, than the, uh, the regular official poverty rates. But uh, we did note that um, the, the, these household vulnerability rates were steadily declining across the years from 55% in 2003. Uh, at least they went down by six percentage points uh, to 48.5% in 2015. Then among poor households in particular, the high vulnerability status even declined by as much as 14 percentage points. So, um, so we are, to some extent, there, there, there are patterns that are emerging here that the vulnerability status and, and poverty are, in a way, uh, the trends are, are pretty much very similar. So with, in a way, the trends even being uh, monitored by uh, NGOs like uh, SWS and, and Pulse Asia. Um, but um, as we look through the, pov the uh, uh, profile, specific profile of vulnerable households, we also similarly see uh, patterns emerging that, uh, that suggest, for instance, the rural population being more vulnerable than the urban uh, population, uh, vulnerability rates being uh, as much as two-thirds uh, of uh, how all households in rural areas compared to uh, about two-fifths in urban areas. And as I said, this is, is about uh, twice to three times the the regular official poverty rates. Um, now, if you look at specifically by regions, uh, disaggregating the data, we, we see uh, ARM being uh, the region with the highest vulnerability rate of uh, around 83.3%. And of these, uh, uh, half are even considered highly vulnerable. Uh, Ilocos was found to have the lowest proportion of households that are highly vulnerable. But uh, half of households, however, are relatively vulnerable, putting it in the middle among the regions. It's still NCR uh, and Central Luzon that are the regions with the least vulnerability rates among the, uh, among the regions uh, below about 35%. And uh, as is expected, uh, vulnerability uh, decreases as households uh, climb up the income ladder. Uh, further, as uh, was earlier pointed out, labor and employment, price and demographic factors are key sources of income variability and, and shocks. Uh, those that depend on, on incomes from fishing, uh, forestry, mining, and other family sustenance activities are found to be highly vulnerable, while those least vulnerable are those uh, with uh, incomes from dividends, uh, those with wages, from non-agricultural activities, uh, those with rents, uh, rentals of lands, uh, those with rentals, val rent income from rents from owner-occupied dwelling, uh, or uh, those with pensions and retirement benefits. So in other words, uh, it's, it appears that the elderly are far from vulnerable. No? Uh, um, that seems to be uh, an emerging pattern. All right. Um, the, at least in vulnerability to future poverty. No? Uh, at least that's what the data suggests. Now, the vulnerability of households with head that are dependent in agriculture is the, the, still the highest among all the sectors uh, at about 82%, but this was 82% uh, in 2003, and it's declined, however, to 72% in 2015. But as I said, the agriculture sector is still the sector with the highest vulnerability rate among uh, the major sectors. Uh, households with heads employed in services has consistent to be, uh, consistently found to be least vulnerable at uh, around 33% in uh, 2015. Uh, higher educational attainment uh, appears to be lessening the risk for households' vulnerability to income poverty. The vulnerability rate drops with increasing educational attainment. More than half of households with heads who had no education are highly vulnerable, uh, and another quarter are relatively vulnerable. 
whereas about two-thirds of households with heads that have had some elementary uh, are vulnerable. And then while less than half of those with high school education are vulnerable. And in contrast, only a quarter of those who have attended some college are vulnerable to poverty. So suggesting the, the real importance of human capital investments, uh, not only by government, but by the households themselves no? as, a, as a way to mitigate uh, vulnerability. Demographic patterns among households, particularly size of the families, especially the number of young members, appears to be contributing to additional risks for vulnerability to poverty regardless of area, uh, whether urban or rural areas. High vulnerable, uh, highly vulnerable households in rural areas in particular uh, have large family sizes than counterparts in urban areas. And we also observe more young members than adults for highly, household, highly vulnerable households in rural areas. Um, as regards the basic sectors, as uh, some of us may re remember, the government's framework for social protection and for defining poverty has been based on a law that dates back all the way to uh, the 1990s, the so-called Social Reform and Poverty Alleviation Act. Uh, this law identified 14 basic sectors and our, our PSA has obtained estimates for poverty, of poverty for nine of these sectors. Uh, farmers, fisher folk, workers in the formal sector, and migrant workers, uh, among children, urban poor, among others. Uh, and we, we, we did, we, we, we started cranking out these vulnerability rates as well for the same sectors, and we observe a uh, similar pattern that I already mentioned earlier that the vulnerability rates for the basic sectors are much larger than the corresponding shares of population in poverty. Um, in part, and, of, and moreover, the most vulnerable appear to be, again, fishermen, farmers, and children. No? Uh, so this is very consistent with patterns in poverty, in official uh, income poverty. Um, and it, apparently, we're also suggesting, as was earlier mentioned, that the lowest vulnerability rates are observed for persons residing in urban areas and also for uh, senior citizens. No? Um, while the country has had some progress in reducing poverty from uh, 1990 um, to uh, uh, we, we do note that the rate of reduction has been rather modest in, in many years except for, as I mentioned by Dr. Reyes in the past, uh, the recent data from the PSA suggests that between to 2015 and 2018, the, at least for the first semester, uh, we've had uh, a, a, a big reduction in poverty. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we, we note that if we're going to think of obs uh, reducing poverty, government and all poverty stakeholders need to see the importance of forward-looking planning and risk resilience building in the context of uh, uncertainty. Public policies uh, will need to start refocusing on risk management. and. Um, we note that two sets of interventions for the vulnerable, particularly protection from likely exposure to shocks and assistance uh, for households to increase their incomes and uh, assets and wealth. Social assistance to poor and vulnerable uh, typically revolve around the formulation of, however, uh, we tend to have one size fits all strategies. Even for instance, when we think of our CCT, uh, or even the last year when we increased, uh, when we provided, we knew that there were the, those at the lower incomes would probably get affected by train, the train law. We provided a uniform cash assistance uh, to all program beneficiaries rather than accounting for the differentiated needs of uh, different uh, groups. Uh, as I said, CCT, for instance, we provide 300 pesos grants for pre-primary and primary students, 500 pesos for high school students, and 500 pesos for all households for health. No? But we do note that there are differences in opportunity costs between boys and girls. Um, and as I mentioned earlier about the train, uh, the train support, we have been giving 200 pesos per month uh, for last year, and I think now they will be increasing it to 300 pesos. Um, or is it? No? At 300 pesos this year and next year 
for all the so-called 10 million lower income beneficiaries. But why is it that we always have to have the same strategy for everyone? No? As if the 300 pesos will be beneficial, equally beneficial to all these families. No? We have to recognize that, the, that poverty has many faces, including vulnerabilities that are stemming from risks to welfare, such as uncertainty from the lack of decent work, uh, or educational attainment, the lack of educational attainment of household members, insecurity from land tenure, and the lack of productive assets, and even imper imperfect uh, information about opportunities. I was just talking earlier with somebody from DSWD, and this is the first time that, I, when I was talking with her about something, no, she, I mentioned that there are now op ma massive open online courses. You can get free training from just go going to Coursera. I, and she said, this is the first time I heard about this. No? I mean, this, unfortunately, I'm pretty sure if she did not, this is the first time she heard about this. This is probably going to be the first time to hear about these kinds of MOOCs also for many of our countrymen. No? Um, while uh, we know that, that uh, our current Nas National Anti-Poverty Commission currently espouses a comprehensive uh, universal and transformative social policy that including a rights-based approach to ensure zero poverty no, becomes, uh, and, and that, that reaching zero poverty becomes the cornerstone of our development policies. Unfortunately, we need to start recognizing that we can't have always just this one-size-fits-all strategies. No? Uh, we, if we want to get more impact in, in efforts to reduce poverty, government really needs to require to have an enabling environment for shared action no, and responsibility with local governments and other, sta stake, or, and other stakeholders. We need uh, a, a social ag an action agenda that addresses all relevant risks to vulnerability, jointly seeing the synergies, trade-offs, and, and priorities in policy responses. But we, had, we have to also use all available resources and institutions and means of implementation across different contexts. We, we need to, to, to sort of not only think of always curing poverty, but also trying to help prevent it, or at least mitigate the harm to people who are at very strong risk from this disease. So central to any social assistance and risk resilience should be differentiated uh, policies. Um, also, we have to start um, recognizing that Sometimes we, it's a mindset. Some, uh, many of us, especially in the, who are not poor, I've heard this often, you know, that, that, that there's this tendency for us to think that, oh, the poor are very lazy. They don't need you know, uh, help. Uh, and, and they think that pantawid, all of these things, is just wasteful. Uh, that it probably should be better used for livelihood. But actually, we need to recognize this is a false choice. Uh, CCT focuses on human capital development and we, we should be recognizing that this development of our human capital has had actually very positive outcomes in the, in the past 10 years since, since the CCT has been implemented, although there are some Im issues that remain. Uh, we note that community-driven development has provided an extra channel of support but we also need to recognize that we need to converge all our efforts for social protection policies and programs because unfortunately sometimes you have all these disconnected things and we don't know whether whether all of these uh, things that we're doing are are really making a, a, a concerted effort no? uh, certainly we where we where we invest we uh, matters no? it's not just investing but you have to recognize where you invest matters a lot so right now, there's, uh, our government has been uh, uh, advocating since, it's, uh, uh, since the election of our current president, uh, this uh, in infrastructure investments, which is very important. But we also need to recognize that it's not just enough for us to invest in infrastructure, but we have to invest in people, no? uh, building their skills and capacities, uh, both education, health, including reproductive health, no? for re mitigating whatever risks they, uh, that, that we are, our people will be facing to future poverty, especially in the wake of uh, likely consequence to the fourth industrial revolution, 
because we need to recognize that there are there are likely inequalities that we currently have that might actually become wider if we're not going to start uh, doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that mind-stimulating presentation, Dr. Albert. Allow me to introduce our next speaker. He was a former professor of economics at the University of the Philippines, where he, he uh, taught from 1978 until his retirement in 2004. Currently, he's a professorial lecturer at the University of the Philippines Diliman School of Economics. His areas of interest include population, health, human resource, development economics, and nutrition. He is also involved in DOH USAID projects on local governance for health. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Alejandro Herin. Thank you for the uh, introduction. myself. Uh, the title of our presentation together with uh, Dr. Abrigo, uh, Sandra Tam, and uh, Danica Ortiz is the challenge of mobilizing local governments for the prevention of child stunting. And, uh, We'll discuss in a while why, why we picked up uh, local governments uh, in particular. The uh, outline of uh, our presentation, uh, first we look at the trends and consequences uh, very briefly. Uh, one can see progress has been slow in preventing child stunting. And uh, from the literature we show why it's important to focus on uh, stunting prevention. Then we look at uh, what generally are the uh, cost-effective interventions in uh, preventing child stunting. And uh, we look at these interventions, and then we look at what, has, uh, what have we been doing with regards to these inter interventions. And we show that indeed we have so many programs that uh, addresses those interventions. But then we look at the outcomes, uh, it's still relatively uh, lackluster. And uh, so if we have all the programs, but the results are still not very uh, 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 bright, uh, where, where could the problem be? And uh, with devolution, we think that much of the intervention occur in the community and at the municipal level, since uh, many of these interventions are really maternal, child care, and uh, infant and child uh, infant feeding programs and so on, which many of which occur at that lower level of the service delivery structure. And that means uh, the role of local governments. Um, then we look at uh, how uh, local governments have been uh, implementing or not implementing uh, the program, the programs. And we look at uh, how we might move forward uh, based on the lessons that we have uh, seen. So, uh, Going to the trends, uh, this uh, summarizes uh, over a 25-year period, starting from the beginning of the MDG period, 1993, to uh, 2018. They just uh, completed the 2018 uh, National Nutrition Survey. And uh, from 2003, we could see that the uh, prevalence of stunting percentage-wise is uh, more or less uh, straight. Uh, and while the MDGs considered uh, underweight as the measure, uh, one could also see that it's uh, relatively flat. And in fact, we have not achieved uh, Millennium Development Goals. I think the, the target was to reduce underweight by two-thirds, so we didn't do that. And more particularly, if it was stunting that we were looking at, uh, the more that we were not able to achieve that. Uh, the importance of uh, importance of uh, uh, preventing child stunting uh, depends on the, or arises from the uh, 
what has been learned over many years uh, from the results of uh, longitudinal surveys. Uh, one is that the uh, consequences of child stunting have serious implications, first for child survival itself, and secondly, its impact on educational performance of children as they enter uh, school age. And then later on, combine these two, poor health, poor nutrition, poor educational outcomes, combine those to uh, result in uh, uh, lower economic productivity when they enter school age, uh, uh, labor force age. Now much of the effect of child stunting, which is really impaired growth and development of the child as a result of uh, undernutrition and uh, repeated infection, uh, something to do with the impairment of its cognitive development, uh, the development of the brain that does not achieve the trajectory that is uh, expected of uh, well-nourished and healthy children. And uh, studies have shown that uh, this uh, impairment can be irreversible after age two. And so there's a small window by which we can address this and that is uh, what they call the first 1,000 days. You've heard that uh, phrase uh, very often nowadays. That is the period from pregnancy up to the time when the child is two years old. Now, in, in the past, there has been some quarrel that, uh, well, we cannot judge ourselves relative to the rest of the world because we're naturally small and short. Uh, and so uh, we cannot compare ourselves with the uh, people from developed countries which are big and so on. But uh, what is uh, uh, critical here is uh, there's now international agreement about the definition, measurement of uh, stunting and what defines what is a uh, normal for human growth. So it doesn't matter that the genetic composition uh, probably doesn't matter at the very early age when uh, as, uh, they have found a, a child that is healthy, uh, well-nourished, would measure more or less the same at a certain age range, irrespective of the race and so on. It's only later when the genetic makeup uh, eventually kicks in uh, in uh, uh, the growth spurt during adolescence and uh, uh, adulthood. So given this, uh, uh, the importance, it's, uh, it's nice to look back at the data that we have uh, and looking at the, the surveys. So the survey that was done in uh, 1993, uh, zero to five children that were found to be stunted, about a third, uh, they are now aged 25 to 29. They are now entering the labor force or are in the labor force. And if they were stunted uh, by age two, that, that means that we're looking at uh, impact on low productivity. And uh, the latest survey, 2018, those are zero to five and they would be vulnerable to higher rates of morbidity and, uh, and even child mortality. Then uh, those who were surveyed uh, in 2008, they are now school age, elementary, from elementary to uh, early high school. And in fact, there's a study being conducted now, uh, sponsored by DOH, NEDA, uh, UNFPA, uh, implemented by a consortium of researchers led by the Office of Population Studies in Cebu, a longitudinal uh, study that starts from the child, 10-year-old children, which will be followed up up to 2030, sort of uh, looking at children now as they go through the SDG years uh, to see uh, how they are faring and uh, so on. So that, that baseline, the 10-year-old, those who were stunted, about a third are also stunted, shows the impact on educational achievement in terms of repeat grades, uh, the, the grades themselves, uh, and so on. That shows uh, uh, impact on the educational performance. Now, as an aside, uh, we ask what is being done? How do we address the uh, performance, schooling performance of these children? Since we can't do anything much about the stunting, we should have done that before they were two years old. So is there a way in which we can compensate for their uh, lack of cognitive development? And apparently there's no real program at the depth that handles this special case, unlike 
uh, where we have uh, children with disability, where we have special education for them. There's no special education for the stunted children. But that, that's something that needs to be addressed uh, in some other way. What we have are school feeding programs, which might uh, be good for the nutrition of the children at that age, but it doesn't uh, do anything more for the stunting. Now, the, an overall uh, uh, index of the effect of uh, all of this thing from uh, 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 higher rates of child mortality and morbidity, schooling performance, poorer schooling performance and raw productivity can be summarized by the human capital index that the uh, World Bank has put together. And uh, just uh, selected a few countries, uh, Philippines somewhere in the middle, uh, shows a 0.55 human capital index, meaning that uh, uh, productivity of the next generation of uh, workers, these are the 0 to 18 years of age now, uh, would have a productivity of only about half of what potentially they could have if they had uh, full health and full education. And uh, the uh, human capital index is composed of three uh, components, the survival rate, which is uh, the survival to age five, schooling, which is both the number of years and the quality of that schooling based on scores in standard international tests. Uh, that's the harmonized test scores. As you can see, our scores are even lower than uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, and even Indonesia. So uh, there's something, uh, I think this has been observed in many of the uh, uh, teams, uh, international test of mathematics and science for this uh, age group of people for several years already. So that's the uh, overall effect of, uh, so we don't think only at survey to survey, oh, it's only one third, but it's one third, one third, one third, one third. So actually it's one third of the entire Filipino population are stunted, if we project it that way. Anyway, what have we been doing? So really when we reviewed what we have been doing, it's not, it's not that we didn't know. So the, the, the one in the blue are the uh, interventions in the first 1,000 days to prevent stunting. These are well known. This has been uh, published, the World, uh, World Health Organization. Uh, then uh, uh, various uh, uh, two sets of Lancet series of uh, uh, papers that summarizes what is known about stunting. So uh, these are well summarized. Uh, by uh, uh, in the context of uh, what is called a stunting syndrome. So starting from pregnancy, the effect on the, uh, on the fetus based on the nutrition of the mother and so on. Uh, the uh, childbirth, the birth outcomes, whether it's low birth weight as a result of poor nutrition during pregnancy, all the way into the nutritional status of the child first in the early infancy and later on uh, in infancy up to year, two years old. So this encompasses both uh, nutrition uh, and uh, uh, control of infection, uh, two major factors uh, defining the probability or the risk of being stunted over the two year period. Well, uh, these are the, what is uh, the cost effective interventions and if we look at what we have been doing, we actually have many programs that addresses those interventions. Uh, we have uh, micronutrient supplementation, which is, uh, of course, a major component and more visible uh, component of the program where uh, pregnant women are provided uh, micronutrient supplementation. Uh, these are usually provided uh, centrally by DOH, uh, which uh, uh, procures uh, micronutrients and distributes them to localities. Although we find in today's newspaper that uh, uh, DOH was not able to spend a lot of money on drugs, medicine, uh, for many reasons. 
food fortification, uh, popular the salt ionization, and uh, so on. The then you have maternal and neonatal care, which is really a continuum of services, uh, starting from prenatal all the way to service to delivery and postnatal. And uh, it requires uh, a series of continuum that if uh, you miss out on some of those elements, it might not uh, provide for a complete uh, setup. Then uh, first six months, the exclusive breastfeeding that is considered to be important. And uh, after six months, the complementary feeding as the child is weaned from breast, uh, breast milk to actual food. And uh, since they are uh, prone to illness, the capacity to actually control uh, infection. So programs like immunization are important, uh, water sanitation, control of diarrhea, and so on. In a, a previous earlier study that we did, uh, we look at some of the gaps in this uh, uh, service delivery. So you might uh, look at uh, prenatal as uh, a major service, but if you look at the components of what should be included in that prenatal visits, so only half, even in the more recent uh, 2015 uh, survey, only half of those who had prenatal visits said that they actually discuss nutrition during that visit. So if it's so important, nutrition during that period, then only half of the women say that uh, they were discussed during that visit. So it shows you a gap uh, in service delivery. Uh, control of infection, of course, uh, we talk about uh, immunization, which has declined uh, over the years. Uh, even the treatment of diarrhea, where there is very, uh, well-known protocol of how to deal with diarrhea in children. And sometimes that is not uh, fully done, especially the addition of zinc in the ORS. So it could be little things, but they might all add up in uh, the whole scheme of things. So we have many programs. Uh, those programs are, uh, there's a, uh, legislation behind them, in addition to DOH's uh, administrative orders. So the policy support for these programs are very strong. Uh, the more recent one for the overall is the uh, uh, Kalusugan at Nutrition ng Mag-anak, which is uh, RA 11148. The IRR was just uh, uh, signed. So let me just uh, go to if those were the uh, interventions and all of the programs that we have been doing, these are the outcomes. So let's go to the under five children, the stunting. This is in 20, 2015, so 33%. There are micronutrient deficiencies among pregnant women. Uh, anemia, 25% uh, deficient. The nutritionally at risk pregnant women, these are measured in terms of their height and weight or uh, uh, body mass index. So 25% of women are considered undernourished during their pregnancy. And that has an impact on uh, the outcomes of children. Uh, one of them is uh, low birth weight, which is a risk factor for not only neonatal deaths, but also uh, future uh, uh, nutritional outcomes. Now we go into exclusive breastfeeding. It's not a uh, nutrition outcome, but it is an intermediate outcome. Uh, if we look at the bottom, I put that down there, about uh, only 25% of children were actually exclusively breastfed for six months. So uh, the rest, 75%, uh, either they were breastfed but not for six months or not breastfed at all. If that is so important, then we can see where the gaps are and where uh, things can be done so far. Then children's uh, micronutrients deficiencies are also there. So micronutrient deficiencies are still there. Uh, some are considered of great public health concern. There has been some improvements, of course, especially vitamin A uh, deficiencies and so on. But that is our record for the many programs that uh, we had. 
uh, those are the outcomes. And so we look at, well, if most of those can be delivered at the local level, uh, so let's see what is happening at the local level. Well, the National Nutrition Council, uh, in its 2014 assessment, midterm assessment of the Philippine Plan of Action for Nutrition, uh, 2011 to 2016, they, they had a, I was surprised to see the rather candid uh, uh, assessment that they made. Uh, maybe we're used to assessment that says, oh, we did uh, pretty well. But this one says, well, actually, one of the main problem is the, what they call lack of LGU mobilization. So, of course, we didn't understand exactly what you mean. Uh, so, uh, later on they say, uh, uh, many of the programs that LGUs had were revolved around weighing. That's uh, weighing uh, of children by the nutrition scholars, feeding in daycare, centers, and schools, which we said uh, that's a bit too late to deal with uh, stunting problem. It might still be useful for other purposes, especially in school children to keep them in school and so on, but it's too late for uh, the prevention of stunting and uh, monthly celebration, or the celebration of the Nutrition Month. And uh, there are stories about uh, that there are actually money in the LGUs. When we were talking to barangay captains some time ago about the need for uh, funds, local funds for family planning supplies, uh, they said, well, let, let's see how we can look for money. Oh, we have money. So uh, let's shift some of the nutrition money to family planning. So instead of having two parades, we'll just have one parade during the nutrition month. Because <laughs> that's isolated and that was a long time ago, but it's really. Uh, then also, uh, we probably can't blame the local governments too much in the sense that all this time with the MDGs, uh, they were guided to focus on, well, our uh, target was to reduce underweight. Uh, the preferred indicator was underweight. And underweight can mean many things. It's actually a composite of stunting and wasting. That's very thin. And each of them can have different sets of interventions. We know now more clearly that stunting, the interventions there are a lot more complex than if you just underweight because you're small and thin. All you have to do is feed. And in fact, if that is the case, then one could see wh why uh, LGUs would be focused on feeding, especially those children that they can now see, which are in daycare schools, in daycare centers, or in schools. Those who are still at home, who are invisible, uh, they might not think of key, key interventions. Uh, then there's also the, uh, in the previous plans, if we analyze the previous plans of the nutrition, National Nutrition uh, Council, we see that uh, it has a broad range of uh, targets from uh, here, the infancy, all the way to adulthood, from non-communicable disease to smoking and overweight and so on. So if you're a local government, then well, where, where am I supposed to focus? And with limited resources, I can focus on something that people can see. That could be the feeding uh, programs, uh, especially if this is done in conjunction with uh, DSWD or in conjunction with uh, DepEd. So it's understandable that they focus on these kinds of programs, which, which might uh, already be too late for uh, having an impact on uh, uh, stunting. So it's only recently, in fact, 2015, when we shifted to the, we moved to the uh, SW, SDW goals that are in the uh, current uh, plan that we focus on the uh, first 1,000 days. Uh, here's another thing. Uh, in addition to our field trips, uh, talking to local governments, not many, but just to get some insights, there's also a, uh, a timely publication 
of uh, LGU best practices in nutrition. But the uh, best practices over a period of time, but there were only 11. And these were the best practices. Uh, you still see school feeding, uh, nutrition education, livelihood programs, and so on. While they are important, where are all the key elements in that uh, overall continuum of care from pregnancy uh, to uh, breastfeeding and complementary feeding? And it's only recently also with the shift in the preferred uh, indicator from underweight to stunting that they begin to collect data on stunting. So uh, one, one cannot really blame LGUs for the predicament that we are in because it might be that uh, the guidance or that they were given were not very clear. What, what are we going to focus on? If it's underweight, exactly what do we need to do? Uh, and if it is uh, stunting, well, the first thing is to measure stunting, and then uh, uh, what needs to be done in terms of clear sets of guidelines. Well, that is now probably clearer based on the plan as well as the uh, new law. So uh, moving forward, so I, I, we're not here to blame local governments. Let's pass, let's move forward. Uh, the first thing is uh, let's now focus. There, there's so many things about nutrition that we can do, but considering the importance of stunting for future uh, of the child, child's well-being and the future of uh, the economy, and the future of our performance in poverty reduction, uh, adapting a stunting prevention as a strategic focus might be uh, something that needs to be accelerated. So we now have the Republic Act that provides uh, a mandate for that. We have the Philippine Plan of Action that for the first time uh, may make it a major focus. And of course there is the uh, 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 Sustainable Development Goals which now adopts uh, stunting as the preferred measure of child undernutrition. Then we need to look at the data. The data, as we said, even if they were collecting underweight data in the past, those data that they get from the Operation Team Bank are much lower than what the uh, FNRI are getting. So it, as uh, NNC was saying, well, if, if that is the data that local governments have, well, it's obvious that they won't put as much priority uh, because uh, if it's only 4% instead of 30, well, it's 4%, just figure out where those households are and uh, deal with them. And then we move on with the other local development priorities. So having uh, data that may not actually reflect what the problem is might also be a uh, consideration for not uh, providing enough priority for that. So improving local data uh, on child stunting uh, would assist in uh, putting child stunting in the proper priority that it deserves. So this is just to give you a comparison of what the FNRI is getting at the provincial level and what the aggregate provincial OPT data looks like. The third one is uh, we think that local governments are all the same. Actually, if we look at, examine their uh, uh, resources, uh, th they are s so, uh, there's a wide range of their capacity to uh, actually uh, uh, put investments in health, and in particular, uh, nutrition. So these are just two examples of relatively rich uh, provinces, uh, Pangasinan and Quezon. But if we look at the municipalities in terms of the uh, per capita health, nutrition, population expenditures. You, you have a very wide variation. So th in the DOAs, they have the LGU scorecard, where they rate uh, LGUs for their uh, capacity to deal with health in particular. So one, one indicator is you should have, uh, I think for municipality, 15% of your budget should be for health. And you get the price if you do that. But it doesn't really help uh, to, to think 15% of the, the San Fabian is relatively small compared to 15% of uh, the highest 
municipality there, I think, Suwal. So even if they uh, spend 15% of their resources, it doesn't really add much to their capacity to provide for health, and in this particular case, nutrition. So perhaps uh, one needs to look at the resources that LGUs have and try to compensate for those uh, LGUs that might not have the uh, capacity to generate additional resources in addition to their era. Uh, some are able to add local revenues uh, than others. A fourth one is to, a fourth one is to uh, strengthen the links among the interrelated interventions. As we mentioned, uh, you have a whole set of interventions, but in those broad interventions, some might be uh, done better than others, and in each of those interventions, there are components that might be missing. One of them we mentioned is the lack of nutrition discussion, even during the uh, prenatal. And even uh, when we uh, look at some of the ways in which our nutrition scholars actually measure uh, uh, children for weight and height, and more recently, the height. But you know, they, they measure monthly for a certain group of children that are already considered underweight, but they measure maybe uh, first quarter and at the end of the quarter. And you have 35,000 of them doing all of this. But uh, if we look at more carefully, so how do they do that? Uh, well, they measure, but do they tell the mothers what is the result? It seems that for many of them, those uh, measurements go through a process by which they're <coughs> collected, compiled, and put in a report, a report form. So we ask, well, when does the mother know that the child is undernourished? <coughs> or maybe when they come back and choose the report. But uh, we figured you're missing an opportunity for communication. Once you know that uh, the child is undernourished, this is the occasion for saying what that means and what you can do about it and to refer <coughs> that parents. The same thing is true when a child visits the RHU, uh, there's no measurement that occurs, and if there's a measurement, it <coughs> it's not recorded. It's not recorded in the uh, if it's SIS, so we don't know whether they're following through uh, the nutritional status of the child. If the child might go there for infection. But then again, they say that is an occasion, an opportunity by which you can look at the nutritional status of the child, especially in early infancy, and uh, consider the uh, necessary communication and intervention. So, uh, uh, strengthening the links. Some of those that are identified are, we are not doing anything about the nutrition of the pregnant woman. We're giving them uh, micronutrients, but the balanced energy nutrition is missing. And we were saying 25% of pregnant women are undernourished and might have some impact on the birth outcomes. We also mentioned about this one, the counseling during prenatal. Uh, the other one is uh, we do a lot of uh, information about what is a proper and uh, nutrient dense type of meal but if the family cannot afford that or doesn't know how to prepare it, uh, they just probably feed the child uh, instant noodles or things of that nature. So there are missing links uh, that needs to be addressed. And uh, there is a, uh, there's a nice position paper by the Association of Pediatrics that details this. But also, these are already in the law as well. So it provides a a good set of guidelines that uh, we can all follow. Then uh, with uh, the devolution and local governments being uh, fragmented, there's a need to uh, forge a stronger inter-LGU collaboration. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't require too many, too many of them involved in the sense of uh, 
going all the way to uh, uh, the hospitals and referral centers. Because many of the interventions, as we mentioned, can be uh, delivered at the community and the RHU level. So at the municipal level, uh, many of the uh, services can be organized, but uh, still have to deal with uh, mayor and uh, barangay captains. But then some of those, uh, especially the births, can be delivered in birthing facilities that can include uh, district hospitals. Now you have to deal with governors and so on. Now we have a program of uh, promoting breastfeeding. So we said all, all women should deliver in health facilities. In health facilities, they have a program, the mother baby friendly uh, facility, where they encourage uh, women who just given birth to uh, initiate breastfeeding. So that occurs in the hospital, uh, the, the governor's hospital. But then what happens if that woman and the child goes back to the community? Who, who follows it up there to continue that exclusive breastfeeding? So that's the community that's run by the barangay captain. So is there a link, uh, collaboration between the governor, the mayor, and the uh, barangay captain in delivering, making sure that these services are delivered? So I think those are uh, relatively few sets of uh, considerations for moving forward. But uh, we think that uh, they are critical in uh, uh, helping local governments move forward. So the, the challenge is because there are so many, they're autonomous, and they can actually make the decisions they want, but uh, can we uh, harness their uh, collective will, the effort, and their commitment so that we can do all of these things in uh, concert so that it can have a national impact? So, thank you. Thank you so much for that very informative uh, discussion, Dr. Herin. May I, may I again call Dr. Albert for uh, another presentation? Pagbabalik, okay. Uh, all right, this is a second paper that was supposed to be uh, presented a uh, few months later. But unfortunately, I think they needed three papers to be presented today, so they asked me to, to give this presentation. Anyways, um, this is a, some work on estimating multidimensional poverty. We'll note that the SDGs has, uh, has provided now a new impetus to, on, on the struggle for poverty reduction because now we note that poverty is not just viewed in strict monetary terms but uh, rather as a multidimensional phenomenon in the context of sustainable development. And second, um, the, when you're looking at the SDGs, there's always been this sense that we need to focus on data disaggregation, granular data for to be able to uh, reduce poverty for different social groups because it's not just important to look at aggregate national levels. Uh, and against this backdrop, this study looks at this, uh, how do we measure multidimensional poverty, reviewing some work uh, in the past of uh, some dif different researchers, uh, particularly Gaurav Dutt and R.C. Balisakan, and also the Global Multidimensional Poverty Index that's being produced by UNDP with the Oxford Group. Uh, so we, but nonetheless, if we're if uh, we're going to uh, institutionalize this uh, measurement, we need to be careful uh, to find out what exactly is the value added in producing uh, this composite index of poverty, because just because poverty is multidimensional need not mean its measurement should be. The outline of the talk is as follows uh, after uh, introducing, uh, first, we might like to review a little bit uh, the current poverty measurement system uh, and also look into the uh, 
the advantages and disadvantages of multidimensional multi poverty measurements and some issues about its estimation before we start actually trying to construct an MPI uh, using indicators uh, sourced from various surveys of the PSA, notably the Family Income Expenditure Survey, APIS, uh, Annual Poverty Indicator Survey, and the uh, uh, National Demographic and Health Survey. But also we look into some the robustness of the empirical results before we uh, suggest ways forward. We note that the Philippines, like many developing countries, has been measuring officially uh, uh, poverty uh, based on single money metric terms, either from, uh, in our case, we're using income data, but in other countries, they use consumption or expenditure. But our laws, uh, particularly the social reform agenda, uh, our social reform and poverty elevation act of way back 1997, actually recognize poverty is, is the lack of income, but also it's, uh, it, there are other dimensions of welfare as well, food, health, and nutrition, education, housing, and other assets. Uh, but because somehow we need to operationalize how to measure poverty, the Philippines, uh, the, the precursor of the, the Philippine Statistics Authority, one of those agencies, uh, the then NSCB, uh, was analyzing income data from another agency than the NSO, which was uh, conducting this FIES, a triennial survey, and which the PSA has continued to conduct, as well as um, poverty thresholds that are independently measured uh, are estimated that represent the minimum income required uh, for a family or individual to meet basic food and non-food needs. And typically, uh, to summarize uh, poverty, the poverty data that's, that's being examined, they come up with poverty, they, they release uh, among not just the poverty thresholds, but also poverty incidents, representing the percentage of the population or even families with incomes below the poverty threshold, as well as poverty gap representing the uh, total income shortfall of poor per families and persons expressed in proportion to the uh, poverty threshold divided by uh, the total number of families or individuals. Now, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Reyes, the last April, the PSA actually released an analysis of first semester data for 2018, suggesting that uh, poverty fell uh, by six percentage points in the entire population, uh, or 6.1 percentage points among families compared to the data from the first semester of 2015. And then among extremely poor, in other words, those with incomes who uh, not enough even for food or su subsistence needs, poverty reduced by 4.5 percentage points uh, in the entire population from 13% uh, to 8.5% uh, uh, by the first half of uh, 2018. And I think, as far as I understand, the full year data are expected to be released sometime by end of the year. No? Uh, now, target 1.2 of the SDGs call for a reduction of poverty in all its dimensions according to national definitions. Nobel Prize economist uh, Amartya Sen argues that income is just one of the possible instruments to avoid or escape poverty. And the focus should rather be on deprivations in key domains such as education, health, employment, nutrition, and participation in political life. Former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon even also wrote when he was still the UN SecGen that uh, poverty measures should reflect multidimensional nature, the multidimensional nature of poverty. And this is why the UNDP uh, has now been releasing a global F estimate of MPI, um, the Multidimensional Poverty Index, aside from the Human Development Index. Uh, both consider a framework of three dimensions, health, education, and standard of living, and uh, a, sta a nonprofit group called the Social Progress Imperative also regularly releases another yardstick called the Social Progress Index. Similar with HDI and MPI, the SPI is uh, based on social outcomes, which determine the level of social progress achieved within a country. The difference is that uh, SPI also includes other indicators such as institutional, employment, environmental, equity, and inclusion factors, among others. 
Then OECD uh, also has been publishing biennial reports since 2011 that discuss uh, its examination of well-being and societal progress using what's known as their Better Life Quality Index, uh, which draws on a report by the Stiglitz Sen uh, Fitusi Commission. And this distinguishes what's known as current and future well-being. Now, our study discusses, uh, describes some measures of uh, this, some of these component measures of development as a starting point. Uh, also, um, uh, discusses mechanics of how to uh, uh, construct a composite index for describing all the multidimensional aspects of poverty, but also explains some methodological issues. We then uh, develop estimates in our study of MPI using, as I mentioned earlier, waves of several household surveys of the PSA, particularly the FIES, EPs, and uh, the NDHS. And then we also look into how robust are the results. Uh, now, we know that uh, we've often been saying that GDP, regardless of whether it's uh, it's, uh, well, well, even if it's an imperfect measure of economic progress, it, this is the standard way by which countries are, are me currently measuring uh, economic activity. GDP appears to, at least the economic growth, growth in GDP is, is uh, important, it, uh, but it turns out it's not sufficient. And in particular for, for the Philippines, we've, uh, when we look at trends going back all the way from 1991 to 2015, uh, there has been reduction in poverty from a third of the population to about uh, uh, one-fifth of the population in 2015. But this reduction was lackluster uh, be between 2000 and 2012, despite robust economic growth that uh, especially started in 2010. Now, when we start wondering why was you know if growth is important, how come it's not yielding enough income poverty reduction? So, on one hand, that probably partly might, that could be explained. First, maybe we're not fully capturing poverty reduction in all dimensions. Uh, in other words, income poverty is not enough, or income data in the FIES uh, needs to do to undergo a little bit more quality examination. Or third, uh, the growth in national accounts, uh, GDP, has not trickled down to the household sector because growth is not inclusive. Or a combination of all of these three. No? But in the first case, during the period uh, 2000 to 2012, when we, had, we actually can, we have surveys that suggest that we've had progress in non-income indicators of poverty. Um, uh, so that might be something that could could be looked into more specifically when, uh, as a way to figure out why was this puzzling you know, that uh, we, in spite of growth, economic growth, we did not have enough poverty reduction uh, in at least income poverty. Now, as I earlier mentioned, uh, the UN Development Program, uh, UNDP, uh, has been releasing since 1990 in its Human Development Reports uh, the so-called Human Development Index, a summary measure of achievement in key dimensions of development, health, education, and standard of living. And the advantage of this index is that it describes in a single measure how countries have performed in attaining overall human development. But the disadvantage is that when you combine uh, different indicators, it will, does not always allow us to see the relative importance of the different components of the index and to understand uh, why the value of the index changes across time. You have to go back to the original co components. So that's why during the, uh, I remember one of the first conferences I attended when I, was a, uh, when I joined government in 2000, uh, in, held in Switzerland, was, uh, was uh, the so-called uh, Statistics, Development, and Human Rights conference no? and uh, at that time I remember lots of official statisticians expressing concern about the usefulness of this HDI because they said it's useful for advocacy it shows differences across countries but the, some people were saying what exactly is the use of this for policy uh, because eventually you still need to look at 
things sectorally. Uh, when HDI changes, you still need to figure out what exactly was changed. And if it's so, why? Then why did you have to aggregate everything in the first place if you're going back to the components? So anyways, um, uh, as I already mentioned, another, uh, you know, people like to summarize so, uh, another group, the, uh, the social progress imperative under the technical guidance of uh, Professor Porter of Harvard Business School and uh, uh, Stern of uh, MIT, they came up with this social progress index this time, 54 indicators, putting them all together in an overall framework. Um, and the stark difference I also already mentioned earlier with HDIs, it includes other things, no? uh, institutional, environmental, equity, and inclusion factors. But just like HDI, the, que the still question is, what justifies putting, what, how do you choose all the indicators? No? It's just like, I, my, 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 my analogy is like a fruit salad. No? How, do, how do you know what to put in the fruit salad to make it taste good? <laughs> uh, so, um, and, and moreover, how much of each of the, the apples, oranges do you put? No? I mean, what are the weights, so to speak? Um, because if you look at even this SPI, when you look at the original paper, it said, the report said, there is no clear theoretical or empirical reason to weight any of the components more highly. So that's why they put equal weights for the different sub-indicators. So it's just it. No? They said, for instance, access to information and communications component for indicators. Fixed broadband subscription, internet users, mobile telephone subscriptions, press freedom index. Health and wellness component has six indicators. Life expectancy, obesity, cancer, death rate, deaths from HIV, deaths from cardiovascular disease and diabetes, availability of healthcare. So my first question is, why, why would you give fixed broadband a weight of one-fourth but life expectancy would be given one-sixth weight. Huh? Why would cancer deaths be given, the, be given the same weight as life expectancy or even deaths from HIV? Okay, but anyway, so that, that, those are the issues here when you're looking at composite indices. That first, what indicators to select, next is what weights to use. Uh, but anyways, you know, you're now we live in a world where we like to summarize because somehow we don't have enough time to say everything maybe, that's part of it. So in 2010, uh, the Oxford Group, Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative Group, uh, uh, together with, with UNDP, introduced the MPI. You know? uh, and this MPI essentially follows the same steps as traditional poverty measurement. They first choose indicators to represent the, the dimensions of deprivation and then they set thresholds with these indicators and the, the dimensions, and then they aggregate the poverty data. So it's still the same I, I, conceptual idea no? of uh, you know, identifying indicators, setting thresholds, and then aggregating the data. But what they do is, uh, for the MPI, they start off with these three dimensions, health, education, living standards, and then, um, they looked at many surveys and they figured out it seems that the DHS is the one that's, that many countries across the world use that's fairly comparable. So they said, okay, let's use DHS. And then <laughs> they, they identified, at least for health, they said, okay, malnutrition, okay, child mortality. For education, years of schooling, school enrollment. Then for living standards, they had six indicators. So all in all, they had 10. And then for each dimension, you have equal weights, so one third, one third, one third. Then within the different di dimensions, each of the indicators will be given equal weights. So, so one half weight for child mortality, one half weight for nutrition. That's why you'll have an overall weight of one sixth for your child mortality and so forth. No? Uh, you get the idea. So anyways, uh, the idea here is that um, uh, for MPI measurement, it, what's important is that for a household, you have to have all of these indicators. No? And then you say, is a household 
Did he have deep, is it deprived in nutrition? Uh, then you get a yes or no. Yes, one. If not, zero. <laughs> Then, uh, so you do this for all of these indicators, no? yes or no, essentially. And, um, and then you, you put weights, and then if uh, the, the Alkire and Foster methodology says that uh, eventually you put weights and then you try to figure out uh, how, to, how to define a poor household as having at least a third of the weighted indicator. So you, after you give a score to all of the households, if the score is 33% or more, it's poor. <laughs> okay. So if you, the household ha has at least a third of the weighted indicators, uh, in other words, deprived in a third of them, then it's considered poor. Okay. So anyways, um, there are certainly a number of reasons, as we already mentioned, for measuring multidimensional poverty. Uh, but Alkiren Foster also said specifically there are strengths because it's very easy to interpret. The, you could look at the analysis of the data across time. You could decompose. Uh, there, the methodology can be applied to now 104 countries, uh, at least on the HDR 2010. And there are also participative processes about what poverty is. Uh, but there were also criticisms, notably from uh, former World Bank poverty guru Martin Ravallion, who said that just because, as I said, poverty is multidimensional need not mean we should collapse all these dimensions into one index because you could all have, have uh, uh, many indices <laughs> rather than a single index. Also, the three dimensions used are not statistically adequately justified. What well, on a... On a clear and sound conceptual framework. No? But nonetheless, they just said, okay, these are three. Maybe it's partly because we remember trees, no? even jokes. Usually, we always three people, no? a Russian, American, Chinese, something. No? Okay. Uh, so maybe that's part of it too. No? You always remember three things. Okay, stop, look, and listen, you know, and whatever. Okay, so three things, three dimensions. Okay. But the point here is you need to have a single survey that captures all of these indicators for each of the households. And in some countries, some of the indicators are not available. For instance, for our NDHS, even if there were supposed to be 10, we don't have all the 10 because we don't have measurements on, I think, I think there were certain indicators, I forget which, no, two are not available, so we only have eight out of, out of the 10. But anyways, uh, that's the point here. So there are issues about all of these uh, calculations. Uh, so, anyways, um, the point also that we're, we must recognize if we're going to generate these MPIs, as summarized by Gaurav Dat when he came up with his own measurements for, on an MPI, he said there are three things that rem to essentially to remember when you're going to have an MPI. One is the dimensions and the indicators. What, do you, what indicators to include, okay, and even the, the, the cutoffs, the he said earlier, 33%. Where did the 33% come from? The one-third. Again, something I'm not too sure of. Maybe because there were three dimensions. So they thought three dimensions. If you have one out of the three, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's where it came from. I'm not too sure. No? But <laughs> I was trying to understand many of the papers of the Oxford group, but some are not. Uh, anyways, that I think was one of the things. Next is the weights. No? So given the dimensions and the indicators, how do you put weights? Well, the, the easiest thing is equal weights. If you don't know anything, give equal weights. But what, what really justifies this? Okay. And then uh, third is uh, uh, how do you aggregate the data? No? Eventually, how do you say who is uh, a multidimensionally poor household or person? No? Okay. Anyways. So as I said, first we did a lot of reviews, although there are some other researchers who did some previous work, but the main work done on multidimensional poverty were done by R.C. Balisakan, who looked at the three surveys that we did now also, NDHS, FIS, and APIS, and Gaurav Dat's work uh, that used only APIS. Um, so what we, and by the way, now the PSA, after we produced our paper, we, PSA also have released its own estimates of uh, multidimensional poverty. You know? 
So I really should have update this. But anyways, uh, we came first <laughs> before we they produce theirs. No? So anyways, uh, let me just say what what more or less uh, Gaurav that already mentioned. Examined these weights more carefully. He said, okay, the global MPI and even HDI are usually giving equal weights equal weights to all the dimensions and then splitting the weights among the indicators within a dimension. So that's the, the usual weighting procedure. But he also said, maybe let's try out other kinds of weights. Uh, one was what's known as a nested inverse incidence weight. Um, essentially, those assets that are commonly owned are given less weight. It makes sense. For instance, if you have all households, for instance, have um, cell phones now, practically. You know? So that means if the poor have, the poor will not will also have cell phones. So you should not give weight anymore to to a cell phone. So that's the idea. So but if you have uh, as, uh, some assets that are uh, deemed less that not are not are not very commonly used, for instance, what's uh, not refrigerators. No? I, even now, I still see households without refrigerators and they keep going to the market every day. So you think that maybe that's a more of a poverty indicator, so that has more weight. So that's the idea. Uh, the ones having more, uh, a, b a bigger proportion of people than who are uh, using that asset, then it will be giving less weight for that. And some other procedures. So he looked at all of this and then in fact I also said, wait a minute, I even in if you do what's known as a multivariate analysis, you will also remember that you could use also principal components analysis and more factor analysis. So we tried to work out using also this now to try to figure out whether we could uh, exploit uh, uh, and, and study how robust the, the results will be if we use just the first one, the first weight as against using alternative weights. Okay. Uh, now this task, I will already, uh, I, I won't go through this in detail, but as I already mentioned, that as far as the HDI, uh, the global MPI framework, they use one third no, as their cross-dimensional cutoffs, but there could be alternative ways of, of identifying who is a household, what household is a multidimensionally poor household. They're just saying, if the, in the weighted indicators uh, your their one third at least one third is the score then you're they're considered uh, uh, poor but anyways again the question is why one third no? but anyways uh, <laughs> since it was not explained too well uh, in the original papers we'll just use this for now no? anyways um, let me just go into the uh, global MPI no? So for the global MPI, because they themselves, they kept changing their indicators across the years, but their most recent methodology uh, used certain indicators, and that's what we used. We backtrack all the way to 2008. So if we're going to use the global MPI methodology purely using the NDHS, the, the proportion in multidimensional poverty was estimated at about 7% into in 2008, and it's come down to about 4.3 percent. Okay, uh, so there has been a reduction across the years in, in, in multidimensional poverty. And if we look at the, if we compare this reduction in percent across the years, we will see that this reduction is in fact bigger than the the income poverty reduction across the years from. Uh, well, let's say 2006 to 2012 no? uh, or 2015 or something like that. No? So anyways, uh, that was what we, we noted here. Uh, further, uh, as was already mentioned uh, in the, uh, if you look at the trends as shown by uh, the papers by R.C. Balisakan, it seemed like the estimates that they were producing, uh, R.C. was producing was, the percent of, uh, oh, this is MPI, not the actual poverty, proportion in poverty, no? but it's nearly close. No? So maybe it's somewhere around, if I recall right, about 15% uh, no? overall, uh, compared with, uh, 
with uh, let me see now. Okay, here you go. Yeah. Compared with Gorab's estimates that uh, that the multidimensional poverty estimates uh, are about uh, let me see seven percent, seven percent across the years. Yeah. From the all all of this by the way was done with APs. Uh, the difference, however, with Gorab Dabda was he introduced extra indicators on labor. No? And I think that was also partly what was done by, by the PSA. Uh, so what we did in this, in this exercise was we used, I think, 11 indicate, oh no, 13 indicators, or was it 11? Let me see how many, I can't even remember now. 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, a little bit more than the... Uh, than the global MPI, no. So, but we were we were looking first at the global MPI with the NDHS, and we were trying to figure out can we try to standardize and see what would be the trends if we are trying to standardize all the indicators of NDHS, FIES, and APs. So, what did we get? Okay, very very different from income poverty. No, the income poverty rates were this. No? By the way, this is FIES, the official poverty rates. But this is, the green one is NDHS estimates, reducing, but uh, the, base, the original baselines were already low in 2008. APIS-based estimates were, let me see, the blue ones, uh, while the FIES-based estimates were the red ones. Uh, so on one level, to some extent, uh, it appears that if you're looking at the multidimensional poverty lens, uh, quality of life in the Philippines appears to be consistently improving. However, the estimates do not seem to be very robust, even if we tried our best to make the, the indicators very comparable across all the surveys. The estimates were, were of varying magnitude, and also the trends were not quite the same, though there is some reduction to some extent. No? Uh, also, the um, uh, what else did we see here? The if we're starting to look purely at the the sub the disaggregated data, uh, the across the regions uh, we are getting the same picture as official poverty that poverty appear multidimensional poverty appears to be worst in ARM uh, and least in Metro Manila and Central Luzon and even Calabarzon and Ilocos. Um, uh, what else did we see? Even as far as uh, sectors of employment, we had noticed that the largest concentration of multidimensional poverty is also in agriculture. Uh, so these are a fairly consistent set of storylines. So on one level, the storylines are not changing whether you're looking at multidimensional poverty or income poverty or even earlier when I showed the, our estimates on vulnerability. No? Uh, however, what I, I started to recognize is, wait a minute, because if we're looking at APs, there's also income data, so maybe we could play around a little bit and relate also the income data uh, with income poverty with, uh, with, with the MPI. But before that, I also, in an attempt to try to, to figure out how robust the estimates are, what would be the contribution of, multi, of these three di dimensions to, to poverty? So if, I look, if I'm looking at APs-based estimates, it appears that it's the health dimension that's, that's the biggest contributor. But if I look at FICE, it's education. Oh, and a little bit of the living standards, half-half. No? The health is least affecting. And then if I look at NDHS, it's uh, the one that's the biggest contributor is the education. So, so clearly, the, the profiles are not quite the same, you know, uh, to some extent, the main, as far as the main contributors. So there's not really as a, a, a robust a, a set of storylines that we're getting. There's some, 
some storylines that are good that are consistent but some that are that are not further if i if i zoom in on the uh, uh FICE based uh estimates because in FICE, we know that FICE has the uh is the source of in of the official poverty estimates so i tried to figure out how let, let me try to compare among the officially income poor oops i cannot point here but among the income poor about 20 percent uh how many are income poor only 20 percent 4.4 percent of the entire population so it we're, it's not one to one no? so even if you are not if you are income poor you may be considered you might not be you might even be considered that vulnerable no? uh, in other words no no deprivations as far as the um, multi-dimensional poverty is concerned so there's there's a little bit of a lack of consistency in income poverty and multi-dimensional poverty although um, and then uh, furthermore um, as I suggested earlier, we tried to work on trying to figure out how robust would be the estimates if we were trying to use, let's say, principal components analysis instead of this equal weight stuff. No? And it turns out that uh, our PCA-based weights, uh, the ones based on, on PCA, are, are, are getting estimates that are fairly comparable to the to the income poverty estimates and also uh, the trends look a little bit similar as well but this so this oh, this entire exercise suggests that there is a lot more to be desired on on uh, trying to come up with a picture of what exactly do we do we mean by multidimensional poverty um, because it appears that there that the, the pictures we're getting will be dependent really on the indicators the choice of the weights, and also, um, um, furthermore, at this point, it's not quite clear how will this multidimensional poverty really contribute to better thinking about poverty or even better policies, because it appears that you know you're getting very, very crude—not really crude, but uh, the results are not very robust. No? Uh, so one of the suggestions we make is that i think government should be a little bit more careful now the psa has already released its initial estimates but we're we're, we're suggesting that it needs to be re rethought because uh, uh i think originally the even it, the psa's committee was a, a, an, a committee of experts but now it has become a committee of an interagency committee no so maybe it's it's a bit a little bit more time for the PSA to start th rethinking that of reverting to a set of experts aside from agency rep representatives in its committee because the danger sometimes is that you know when it becomes an official set of statistics everybody thinks it's bible truth you know? and then suppose the estimates now are just are are you know, you're getting pictures that are not quite clear, <laughs> especially for policy. So we we think that it it might be important to to look this carefully a little bit more, and perhaps. Uh, but that having been said, we're not saying that multidimensional measures should not be generated. We're just saying that for now we're 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 getting very uh, wobbly results, no. And so we, I mean, I personally think that there might be some value to, to generating multidimensional poverty partly because income poverty will never really fully capture uh, welfare indicators per se. You know? But if we are going to come up with such measures institutionally, then we need to also have a way of making sure that, that uh, we're not getting that whatever pictures we have are are real rather than you know uh, you know all these fluctuating numbers which may not necessarily give uh, give a very good policy advice because at the end of the day data is going to be an input for policy so if your data is is not quite 
uh, it's confusing to some extent. It may also it may it may lead to more confusion rather than uh, than than help uh, for our policymakers and our poverty stakeholders. Uh, maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, Dr. Albert. Now we proceed to the open forum. May I call Dr. Helene and Sir Toots to please occupy the front seats? Okay. May I also request our um, participants to please state their names as well as their affiliations or the agency they're, uh, they're from as well as the uh, sector they, uh, they are representing. For this forum, we will be taking one question at a time. So we would like to go first. Yes, sir. Dan Agustin, uh, Agricultural Sector of the Land Bank of the Philippines. Thank you for the excellent uh, presentations, especially the attempt to measure uh, poverty. And to Sir uh, Albert, first question would be uh, on fisheries and agriculture. In 1997, uh, our government uh, passed the, uh, uh, the law on to modernize agriculture and fisheries. Well, uh, the principal aim was to reduce poverty. May I know if you have taken this into account how uh, it helped alleviate poverty. Thank you very much. Sir Toots? In addition, uh, what would be uh, measures still uh, to add to this uh, program? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Sir. Sir Toots, your response, please. Well, I'm, I'm not uh, regularly monitoring the agriculture sector except for how it, uh, how, how it pertains, how it performs relative to poverty and vulnerability, but uh, but clearly, you know, when you have, I think what Alex already mentioned earlier that it seems that we have, we have a lot of laws already being uh, out there. The policies are, the, the question is how much of these this legislations and policies are, are having deficits in implementation. Uh, when you look at modernization, how much modernization really has happened? Uh, I often wonder, especially when I just go on the countryside and look at how and, and compare with how our agriculture sector is to other countries of similar development uh, where now things are getting a little bit more, um, we, we seem, seem to be more on the, on the uh, not on the frontiers of technology, using technology. Uh, and, and further, um, uh, it, it appears that the really, uh, as, you know, there hasn't been much, I mean, we, we, we may be having a lot of programs, so to speak, but the question still is how, whether all of these programs, particularly for the, for the farmers, are, are being impactful. And the, the fact that, that poverty has not changed, whether look at it from income poverty, vulnerability, or even multidimensional poverty. It's pretty much the same storyline that things are not changing. So if things are not changing, we're, we're, do, we're not doing the right thing, obviously. Okay. Other questions, please? Yes, sir. Sir, sir Val? Val? PIDS. I have a question for Dr. Harin. So, very enlightening presentation. I'm a bit, your slide number eight is very striking on, on stunting, on your presentation on stunting. You would see the, the uh, academic scores of Vietnam is 501, mm -hmm. which is similar to very rich countries like the US. So, have we examined what's happening in, Thaila, in, in Vietnam? And our score is 400 plus, which is the average for an, an LMIC. So maybe we should examine what's happening in Vietnam. Um, it's a very poor country. So there might be something interesting there to examine. Um, um, second, 
Uh, second question um, is, when you went to LGUs, um, did you uh, check the interface of NNC and DOH? Because there are, um, I don't know if this is um, 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 true, but there, there is a schizophrenia going on in, in, in LGUs when it comes to, um, to it comes to DOH and NNC. And third question <laughs> from uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Francis is, can we actually reverse stunting? So what will happen if you miss the uh, first 100 days? So sorry, I have uh, three questions. Okay, Dr. Herin. Well. They said it's uh, irreversible, especially the uh, impairment, uh, cognitive impairment, and so on. So that's, uh, I think, a major concern. Can, can we do something about the stunting part? That's why uh, in this 10-year-old uh, uh, study that's being done now, we said if it's too late for reversing the cognitive impairment, can we compensate for that impairment? through the education, educational approach that you, but apparently they, they, they haven't uh, gone to that particular, and maybe not a problem. And in fact, when we uh, asked, uh, we had uh, an opportunity to ask the undersecretary for uh, DepEd, and so they, they don't have a specific program on that. I was able to ask it from uh, another official in a different setting. And when he said, well, yeah, we have, uh, it's, uh, it's the way the, Curriculum is organized, so my understanding there is, uh, if they, if the teachers begin to see that the, there's a large s s uh, part of the class is, uh, is is slowing, so they adjust the pace. So my thinking right away is, what happened to the smart ones? <laughs> Are we slowing everybody else? Uh, and if if so, then that's. One of your answer why our scores are relatively low, but uh, in, in terms of the scores, if stunting has something to do with uh, uh, your scores in school as well as scores in tests in international tests, uh, I, I want to see first how the uh, the stunting in in Vietnam. I, I forgot they, they also have a high, relatively high stunting at the beginning, but uh, they were able to reduce that I think quite fairly. Especially, they have better performance in child uh, mortality and uh, maternal mortality, and so on. So, uh, their their health system is uh, uh, a lot better, uh, given the same level of expenditure per capita or expenditure uh, in relation to the GDP, and so on. So, I have to take a look at that. But uh, uh, th there's uh, a lot of other factors. One is the pressure. If we, ha if we read the uh, papers regarding what is the condition of our public education system, that, that where I think now you have three shifts uh, because of the very large number of population. Uh, and that affects uh, the quality of teaching and so on. I remember uh, Prof. Mahar did this uh, uh, projections uh, PREF, Population Resources Environment in the Future. And uh, one of that uh, thing there was uh, how population uh, growth will be uh, reduced, and that would have an effect on your entrance into the schooling population. And uh, I look at that uh, afterwards. And I if we had uh, achieved the uh, projections that they did before, our projected number of uh, school children would be much lower, and it would be much easier, I think, to adjust to addressing the requirements of that uh, smaller growth of school age children, rather than what actually happened, which uh, every year we read in the papers that we lack classrooms. Uh, can't we project how many classrooms we want? We already know the population growth rate and things like that, the teachers and so on. So, well, there are many factors in the educational front and then the, uh, what might be the effect of stunting on the educational performance that can affect those kinds of scores. Uh, we know it could be low compared to the others, but uh, why should it be lower than uh, Vietnam or Thailand or uh, Cambodia and so on. So we need to, to look at more carefully the educational system and so on. 
uh, as far as the interface, uh, you probably know about it already since uh, you mentioned it. We, we did come across, uh, you know, these are relatively uh, sensitive things, especially when we talk to them, they're defensive, but uh, sometimes they're willing to say it out uh, that they are, in some cases, problems with the interface. You have actually two sets. NNC have the regional uh, people, and they go down and do the planning, and sometimes not fully informing the uh, provincial, um, uh, provincial health officer and things like that and so on. Or you might have the regional DOH you go so and does her own sets of activities uh, and things like that. So sometimes the interface is not as clear. And there's also a problem at the locality because the NNC is organized in terms of committees. You have the regional committee the, um, headed by the regional council, then you have the provincial committee headed by the uh, governor, the municipal committee headed by the mayor, and so on and so on. And there are members in that committee. And then there's a focal person, uh, which is uh, what they call either the municipal uh, nutrition action officer or provincial nutrition action officer. And so in the municipality, for example, that officer might be under the SWD. Or sometimes it can be under uh, the MHO, and so on. So sometimes if it is the SWD, and much of your interventions are really about health, then uh, it's difficult for the uh, DSWD person who is not directly under the MHO to have coordination in the actual implementation of some of the health-related nutrition interventions. So there are, there are those kinds of uh, uh, issues regarding coordination among the different structures that were developed. Uh, you have the NNC structure, DOH structure, then you have the local government structure. Uh, for example, the municipal nutrition action officer can be under DSWD, so he's uh, under the direction of the DSWD municipal, or he can be under the mayor's office, which is another layer of how do you uh, deal with, and he might not uh, necessarily be uh, 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 an expert on nutrition, so it's, it's more coordination in the sense of uh, maybe uh, calling for meetings and so on. So then there are many difficulties on the ground in, in that kind of uh, governance system. And you multiply that with uh, 2,000 LGUs. <laughs> and so uh, uh, sometimes it's not a wonder why we're not moving so much, uh, as much as we want. Uh, don't, don't, those are some. Other questions, please. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Limbs Abrahena from the Ateneo School of Medicine and Public Health. I would like to thank our two excellent uh, speakers for their wonderful lectures. Uh, my question would be directed to Dr. Harin. Since you have mentioned about the issues on the LGU, sir, that should have been my second question. But since you have already mentioned it, so. What would be now effective strategies then to engage these LGUs to look into these recommendations that you have presented in your uh, pre uh, presentation? And then my second question would be now, I am grateful that you mentioned about the role of the CCTs, how, how the CCTs have been figured in your presentation. Okay. So do we have now actual data using now the CCT beneficiaries in looking at the different indexes which you have measured in your study? effects of stunting to child survival, such as infection control, nutrition and overall health, and school performance, because economic uh, uh, effect would be later on. So since we have the CCT program already, thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Herin? Yeah. You mean uh, what is the effect on the CCT uh, group as a group? Uh, uh, so, uh, the second question would be more looking at the data. Mm -hmm. So, because the presented data is looking into the general yeah, aspects, yeah, yeah. so, but since we already have now have the CCT program, so at least yeah. we would have a uh, stronger background, uh, or perhaps a strong, uh, at least a cohort of uh, yeah. these beneficiaries, and then the effect of the CCT, and looking into now that the, the various indices, would yeah. ha we have that particular data. Yeah. 
there, uh, the National Nutrition Survey has uh, data on, uh, well, for example, exempt stunting. And that can be actually um, classified in terms of CCT, non-CCT. And they actually um, have that in the, in, in the survey itself. Um, it is not, I think, uh, it's not uh, always published as such. Uh, but uh, once uh, that data is available, that means once it's available for public use, then uh, people can uh, try to work on that. But the one that is uh, uh, working on uh, CCT in terms of the, you know, a lot of other things. Uh, one of their study was whether the CCT program actually have impact on stunting, among other things. I think much of their evaluation show very clearly that it has impact on education <coughs> of children. The children actually do go to school. And uh, it's easy to see because you can see the child going yeah. to school. Sometimes it's difficult whether the uh, pregnant woman goes to a health facility because uh, sometimes it's invisible. But uh, does it have an effect on stunting? I think they had four rounds of uh, monitoring and evaluation. I think in the very first one, they showed a very significant impact on severe stunting. But then after the other rounds, they could not find any more effect. So we were wondering whether that first one was uh, just a, uh, uh, a fluke, because <laughs> it cannot be replicated in others. We would expect that uh, things would be better as you move forward. Uh, so uh, uh, I think that the next round, we'll see whether they're. So that was one of the puzzles. Of course, it's the first one that gets published internationally, the succeeding. Uh, uh, I haven't seen it published in a journal, but uh, it has been uh, described in, at this, in this forum at, at one point and so on. Uh, one, uh, one hypothesis uh, that might, uh, have, might be related to standing, but it's not uh, necessarily connected when they were discussing this. But uh, when it comes to health in general, the indicators are not as uh, in fact, well, compared to the education of children, like uh, uh, visits to the facility or uh, prenatal care, uh, it's not clear whether it is having an impact. And one of the suggestions, one of the <coughs> assessment is that, well, these uh, CCTs are dispersed all over the country, and they all have different uh, healthcare availability environment. So you might have CCT groups uh, that might be located in areas where the availability of health services are not as good as in other areas and so on. So the, the impact on the healthcare might not be as uh, strong or visible, especially in areas where it's a, it's a supply constraint. Uh, the CCT gives you a demand side uh, intervention, but then there's no supply, there's really no uh, quality care that they can go to uh, readily and so on. So uh, one needs to also look at uh, once we do the CCT, whether the services that uh, you want them to uh, uh, avail of are actually there. So that's uh, another set of policy measures. Uh, it's easier for the education because our schools are already in place and uh, so on. But uh, what happens in the schools which are overcrowded and so on is another matter. And that might help explain some of the scores that we're getting. Uh, the, 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 the study that is uh, being done by the uh, Office of Population Studies, this longitudinal one, uh, they also have collected data on CCT, but that is not yet analyzed, but that would be a, a good uh, thing to look at. Uh, how different are the CCT children uh, relative to the non-CCT children and so on. Relative to many aspects of their health, schooling performance, and many other things. So uh, we will encourage them to make that kind of analysis. Yeah. So how about the first question? Which is? Which is, uh, do you have effective strategies to, s to encourage LGUs look, to look into the findings of your study and your recommendations? Well, the, the 
approaches we mentioned, uh, things moving forward. Uh, first, on our part, to uh, communicate properly the importance of stunting. What does it mean? Uh, and why, why is that uh, the focus now of the new law, the uh, PIPAN, and uh, the international community in terms of the uh, sustainable development goals? So it, it must be important because it has, uh, in fact, changed the indicator that we want to look for. So that needs to be communicated properly. And uh, this is a recent development. I think the, the most recent plan is the one that uh, articulated it uh, more clearly than in the past because of the international movement towards that as well. But how well that has uh, been communicated to the local governments uh, still probably needs to be looked at. One is uh, in the 2015 uh, nutrition month, that's when it was introduced. But uh, even in the uh, uh, compendium of uh, LGU actions, uh, it's not clear cut that they were looking at stunting as a major component. The leadership program of Sui League, which has actually engaged uh, governors and so on, uh, that thing also, they, they, they have something in nutrition, but not very clear cut or focus. It, it's, it's not evidence from how they articulate their priorities that they are engaging uh, stunting prevention as such. So they might say nutrition, and they talk about uh, having a uh, a milk production center, uh, and so on, which might uh, be the input to the, your school feeding program. Uh, again, it's uh, too late for that intervention to affect uh, nutrition program. So uh, trying to uh, have a, a more uh, deliberate uh, communication program, effective communication program that brings together these new scientific findings, or not new, but uh, putting it together, uh, because I think there are still a lot of uh, misconception, uh, even among the uh, medical community about stunting. Uh, I think in one of our discussions, some of the hospital chiefs said, what, do you, what are you talking about stunting? Uh, we're short, because he's also short. But there's nothing wrong with me. I'm a pretty. Uh, I'm sure there's nothing wrong with him, he's pretty smart. So <laughs> it's not a question of shortness, uh, but stunting is really about the impairment of your cognitive and development because of poor nutrition and uh, repeated infection as you were growing old, uh, grow as, as you were growing, and that's not the height per se. Um, so uh, then also in one of the forum, the, the head uh, representative in the uh, House of Representatives in charge of uh, health also mentioned that uh, you should uh, um, communicate this clearly to the local government because it is something new. We still don't understand it. So maybe that's why we put it there. The first uh, recommendation is uh, the communication is let's adopt this. And so we have a new law that is now a uh, more convenient vehicle to bring it to the local government. Because if it's just PIPAN, if you mention about uh, this interface that might be problematic, so the getting it across to the uh, LGUs might be difficult. But if it is uh, law, and hopefully if it is uh, uh, strengthened by an executive order by the president, uh, that might uh, get it uh, a stronger push. Then the rest are data. They should, uh, we should uh, take a look at data. Why are they getting uh, data that uh, shows very low prevalence rates? Whether, whatever they're measuring, whether it's stunting or underweight, is it the measurement? Uh, I saw the height boards, they're quite heavy. So, and so they use many different kinds. And, so, uh, and then the, the financing part is also important. Uh, because we we didn't do anything, we just say do this. But some have a lot of resources, and uh, even if they have other priorities, they can probably if they uh, engage in this, they would have resources to do so. But others, even if it's a priority uh, and uh, have a 
higher proportion of their budget on nutrition, still the absolute amount would still be small because of the wide variations and so on. And then all of those uh, missing links that uh, needs to be looked at individually at the, at the LGU level and, and see, help them determine what it is. And uh, in fact, one of the, the, the head uh, of the division of the child health in DOH, they said uh, what they need now is really a, uh, a uh, uh, what do you call it, a, a set of guidelines uh, really comprehensive guidelines for local government to, to adopt because I said, we didn't have that before? Well, probably we don't have because you notice that we have so many different programs and each of those programs is headed by a program manager. And the question now, if you're talking about interface, is we wonder whether those program managers talk to each other. Uh, and that, that, that's just only in DOH. Do they talk downwards and so on? So, uh, if there is it's such a guideline that is comprehensive and the law specifies we bring this down to the local government, then that might be a good start that we can really move on. Yes, sir. Please, I please use the, the microphone at the back. from SWS. I wanted to ask something about the setting of official living standards, official standards over time. Because I think it's uh, appropriate as a country gets better off that its uh, standards should go up or at least should not go down. Right? You don't want your data to seem to improve because you lowered your standards. At least you should maintain them, but you should never reduce them just for the sake of, sake of improving the statistics. Is that acceptable? <laughs> well, don't have to answer that because I'm now going to remind people, if you don't know it yet, that in 2011, the NSCB lowered the poverty line on its own. It lowered the poverty line. It wiped out one million of the poor by the stroke of a pen, just by lowering the poverty line. It decided that you could get the same amount of nutrients by spending less money on food. And so it changed the menu and made the food cheaper but it definitely wasn't as the same standard as before. You know? There was no more meat, for example. And there are many examples where you could look at the menu and the menu deteriorated. Right? Actually, it was the second lowering of standards. There was one in approximately 1992, I think, when alcohol and tobacco was removed from uh, the minimum, you know, because on the feeling that that's not required, you know, for a minimum standard of living. And so they took away an allowance for alcohol and took away an allowance for tobacco, and that made poverty look smaller. Right. And maybe for tobacco and alcohol, you can you know, you can get people to accept that. But in 2011, when they all of a sudden lowered the poverty line, without explaining it to everybody, I think that was actually, you know, unfair. You no, know? uh, improper to do. And so I would, I would uh, hope that it will never happen again that there will be a change in the standard just to improve the statistics. In fact, I don't think it's ever been explained as to why it happened in the first place. I was there when uh, Romy Di Rola explained what he did, and people were shocked. You know, why did you do this at this time? Right? 
And by the way, that caused trouble in the other programs because they were using the previous line, and then all of a sudden they lowered it. They said, oh, how can we now exclude people whom we already included by saying that, oh, sorry, you're no longer qualified because the poverty line is lower now. Now, that's, that's I think, uh, something which must not happen again. And I, I hope there are means of doing it. It was, it was foul play in the first place. And it should never happen again that the standard is lowered, you know? It should always be maintained or at least going up to assure people that there is an intention actually to improve the standards for the people. Thank you, sir. Dr. Albert, would you like to comment on that? I, th I think this was a, a communication issue. There was not a really a lowering of standards, Mahar. Uh, what really was done was, I think this was up upon the guidance of the, tech, the then technical committee. It was a, a committee of experts that they recognized, including R.C. Balisakan, who recognized that the old poverty lines were inconsistent. In other words, the menus in one, some areas were higher, were much higher than they should be if you look at cost of living. Because theoretically, the menu should be comparable across areas. But unfortunately, because of the availability or the lack of availability of some items on menus, it was not consistent. So what they initially tried to do at that time, I was just a member, I think, uh, you know, so we were a committee. I, didn't, I actually advocated something else. I said, drop the menu and come up with a basket, which is, which is actually the more standard way by which food poverty is estimated in un other countries. But I was outvoted. But anyways, I still admit that I think while it was not an a perfect thing, but they wanted to standardize the menu. So because before there was a regional menu, and then they were just putting different prices from the provinces to come up with poverty lines across the country. So, but it was not a lowering of the poverty line per se. It was the, uh, the, the, the point was to make it a consistent standard. So there was a national menu that was the developed. And then eventually uh, that was why it appeared as though the poverty line got reduced. But it was not because they really wanted to, to drop it, to, to drop down, to drop the, the poverty line as it was. No? So I think that was not deliberate. That was not the intention, but I think it was just there. But my point still is that regardless of whether we understand this, this nuance, right now uh, the PSA, whether now they look at income poverty or now multidimensional poverty, I think it's important that, that there should be more experts talking rather than purely agencies talking and then there's the PSA itself. Although I'm glad that Celia still there in the committee uh, as a representative, in fact, she still chairs the interagency committee, but I'm just worried because after, the, for instance, the multidimensional poverty estimates, initially they had the set that was presented in interagency, but they were not really approved, but still PSA released it. You know? So I'm a bit worried because when PSA released it, and then now my own estimates suggest they're wobbling, depending on what indicators, what weights to use, it may be problematic and it may, again, then my question is, will these new estimates or these statistics contribute better understanding on poverty and what should we be doing to reduce poverty in all its dimensions? That's my concern. So I think that's why I think the committee, maybe Celia might even suggest that, that perhaps it may be time for the, because originally there were interagency committees, not just for poverty, but even for surveys, but they're all, they were dropped. They all became interagency committees. No? So I think that's uh, my sense. But uh, because you know, we now have a new leadership at the PSA, and uh, so maybe that's something that we can just suggest. Whether they listen to us is another thing altogether. <laughs> but, uh, but that being said, uh, you know, I, I do recognize your, your, your point, Mahar, that indeed, as countries, improve in their living standards overall, poverty and poverty lines have to be re-inspected. But in certain periods, I think that originally when we discussed this, that 
when there was a change in 2011, uh, there was a suggestion by the committee that the, commi the, that the poverty lines should not change except for price adjustments, which is what they did. But now I think there's, there will be a review after 10 years. So it's, 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 it's about time for, for them to, to start rethinking poverty lines, measuring poverty, because in a way, as standards change, I fully agree that you need to re rethink how we describe poverty, because that will be very important, especially for policy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Albert. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for very enlightening uh, discussions. Um, my question is for Dr. Albert. Um, we recognize that we need to uh, we need to segmentize or the segmentation on poverty and uh, vulnerability. But uh, for us who are working in the ground, uh, we are always confronted with a problem of data, um, at, at least municipal data, because what you see in the in the websites of the different agencies are regional data and uh, provincial data but what's useful to us is municipal data because um, on decisions like where to go to or what what interventions can be appropriate with um, the different municipalities relies on uh, data. Um, is there any um, effort now to have a hub of uh, where we can get information of the different um, uh, information? Uh, um, we are lucky if there are updated CBMS in municipalities, but I think even CBMS uh, are not, uh, not all municipalities have CBMS and uh, they are not updated uh, yet. Um, second issue mentioned about uh, the fourth industrial revolution and um, you said that um, there may be some areas that uh, that uh, will be widened because of the uh, industry, the effects of the industrial, fourth industrial revolution. What do you think are these uh, areas? Because it may be useful to us uh, to in identifying interventions so that we can increase capacities at the ground. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Albert, yes. please. Thank you. The thing is, I think we need to uh, the SDGs I already mentioned early, I, I, the start of my, my talk, uh, are pushing really for much more disaggregated data. That, uh, that's something that countries have to recognize are very important. So by disaggregated, all the way granular, if possible, not even just municipal, even further down, if possible. But the, the fundamental reality is this. PSA gives pictures from surveys and sens censuses they could give data all the way down to municipal, even village level, barangay, kaya, no? But censuses they do once in a blue moon, no? Uh, surveys, however, only give big pictures because of the way that they, these were designed. It only gives really big pictures. It cannot give municipal level. However, that being said, there are now efforts, even by PSA, to, to sort of mesh traditional data sources and alternative data sources like satellite data imagery to be able to mesh them together to come up with finer data on municipal level and, and, and faster in a way because you have, let's say, luminosity, <laughs> light, light data that's captured from satellites no? uh, to, to figure out whether there's economic activity in an area. No? So this is being done, and I, and I congratulate the PSA to, to, for together with which is being given technical assistance by ADB to start looking at all of this. Uh, but the various agencies, they also, including municipalities, you have CBMS, they, they, are, they all have all of these pockets of databases. But unfortunately, what I'm th seeing now is that a lot of people are afraid of data protection laws that 
that sort of uh, hinder people from from re from readily uh, making this available to other researchers. For instance, earlier there was a mention that uh, can you get information on CCT beneficiaries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So in theory, you know, unless the the data producing agency is comfortable with data protection, they're sometimes a little bit worried <laughs> about all of these things of data privacy. And uh, this is this is this is sort of the 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 the, 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 the difficulty now that we need a lot more granular data, disaggregated data, to be able to really reach out those who probably are missing from surveys because sometimes surveys only give big pictures and the samples are so small, so they may not be able to give information on about people with disability, people with AIDS, et cetera. Uh, so it's, it's a big concern. Um, however, the LGUs themselves will need to understand that if they're going to collect data, they sort of need to have some standards so that we know, we need to know. Kasi minsan, anong nangyayari, feeling ko is that everybody's doing their little things, including data collection, but nobody sort of acting as a, as a, you know, doing a baton, <laughs> uh, a, compo uh, a conductor, trying to figure out standards across different data producing entities and data collection <laughs> entities. Uh, and that should be one of the work that PSA should be doing. But unfortunately now, everything's now being thrown at PSA, including now the national, the national ID. So, so they're they're at a loss. I mean, I, I feel for them. <laughs> they're 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 really uh, overwhelmed with with all of these pressures, uh, and I I do not know to what extent they can they can live up to all our expectations. But that being said, we should keep communicating these needs that we have, especially for to be able to come up with good good uh, policies and programs. Now, regarding uh, my statement about inequal fa the fourth industrial revolution and inequalities, the, 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 the idea really is this, that because of new technologies, there's, there's a reality that some people are going to be left behind even be uh, whether, because skills, for instance now in agriculture, reality is if, you're getting, if you become a farmer, do you need to, do you quote, need to have a PhD in agriculture? It would be nice to have, but then is it a, a prerequisite? So unfortunately, most of the time, the workers in agricul the agriculture sector are still low-skilled. And there's, there's nothing wrong with being low-skilled if they develop the skills, especially if there are changing times and there are changing business environments. But that's not happening as much. In certain areas, yes. In certain other areas, no. In, for instance, uh, um, our BPOs, because they're more threatened that some of their jobs will be replaced, so now they're, they're reskilling their, their workforce. But it's happening only in segments, and my, my problem is, I do not know to what extent, again, are we having like a, a comprehensive way of making sure that we're reskilling the entire workforce. Supposedly, within the next three to five years, each person who is employed should be having 100 days of training to understand that then there's a very different set of possible jobs that you might have and occupations. They even say that people may not have a single job anymore in the future. You may have between eight to 10 jobs and occupations. But for you to do that, you will you need to have skills that can easily go from one job to another. And <coughs> is there flexibility if I resign from my job now and then will I be able to bring my, my SSS or GSIS contribution the same level to my next job? Government isn't quite doing all of these things to make it easy. So we need to sort of rethink all our regulations because the reality is inequalities may get larger with all of these technologies, new technologies happening more. And because some people, like I remember when my mother was alive, she would never push the button for the television. She would say, you be the one. It's by choice. Some people may not even want 
to use technologies. And, be, and for these people, we will need to have social protection because they don't want my choice. Thank you, Dr. Albert. Yes, sir. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, just certain comments now. Um, given the presentations of Dr. Albert and Dr. Hirin, including uh, a question on rural poverty, uh, perhaps I do uh, agree with Dr. Albert that there is really much has been done actually in terms of policy. What is actually needed is more monitoring and evaluation, especially on the ground. Example, we've been funding AFMA year in and year out, billions of pesos every year. How, how much of that has been spent effectively? Uh, has, made, has it made a contribution in terms of uplifting rural poverty? Billion, billion ang hindi, hindi mo alam kung paano nagasta actually. Um, and some of the reports we don't actually see. Uh, perhaps there's more a need not only to do the M&E, but to communicate the results of the M&E so that um, interventions could actually be done. Now, um, but there's still room for policy. For example, the local government code was passed in 1991. Five or ten years after, it should have been reviewed. Have we reviewed the local government code? No, we haven't. Piecemeal, perhaps, or what is needed is omnibus. And perhaps that's where uh, Dr. Hirin and the others could actually come into the picture on how it should be actually be amended. I have a concern or a reservation, perhaps, with uh, an observation of Dr. Hirin that we fill in the gap for the resources of certain municipalities accepted. Certain municipalities don't actually have the resources. But sometimes my point of view is why could some municipalities with poor resources actually spend or give more for health expenditures than others? So the question perhaps is how do we incentivize these municipalities to actually spend more? Because uh, Katulad ng Pangasinan, I think Swal and San Fabian, San Fabian and Sawal, actually I think San Fabian is actually better than Swal, but Swal is spending more, as you were saying, on, on health. Why is that the case? And San Fabian has, I think, more resources ex uh, economically, although Swal has more natural resources than San Fabian. Um, and then another thing is, in regard, for example, to rural poverty, we haven't actually passed the, uh, the national land use policy. We spend for irrigation. Pero yung irrigation, putol-putol. Hindi, hindi mag, napuputol yung mga irrigation systems kasi andyan yung land conversion. No? What are we doing about it? Kahit na sabihin magtapong ka ng pera dyan sa irrigation, eh putol-putol nga yung irrigation system mo. Eh. Kasi yung mga tao hindi maayos ang pagka-implement ng, ng at wala tayong national land use policy. So I think um, perhaps it's more a combination of all of these things and what best fits, uh, especially if we put our minds to it, especially now that a new Congress has come into the picture. Perhaps you could help Congress in this regard. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before we answer, or before uh, Dr. Albert gives her his thought on the rural, rural poverty, may, I, uh, may we hear from Dr. Herin um, his thoughts on how do we incentivize municipali municipalities who spend more on health? Well, that's a uh, difficult uh, one is, uh, of course, the theoretically, uh, they would invest more if they know it's a real problem uh, in terms of their understanding of the impact. And then uh, eventually, their understanding of uh, what the political gain for investing in that particular uh, problem in the local community. Now, uh, 
we, we said that we might not have uh, fully communicated uh, the importance of the problem, the science of it. But even if we do communicate the problem, maybe we're not communicating it in such a way that also take into account the political motivations for doing so. So how does one uh, get uh, the mayor excited about something, especially on something where the benefits are long run and you might not even observe it, whereas the cost is right now? Uh, how can we actually design a communication strategy that can help him think about those long-term benefits can be discounted to the present, expressing uh, real present value, and then uh, make it his own. Uh, I was uh, in my not so idle moments. Uh, for TB, it was easy for me to think of how a mayor might go about spending more, because you can help him prepare a speech about why TB control is important. Because we know he has to understand the problem that this is infectious. And so he can have a speech that, look, uh, if you have TB, or if you think you have TB, you have to have, uh, go to the health center, have it uh, diagnosed and so on, uh, and get it treated. I, we, I already talked to the Sangunian. They already passed uh, ordinance uh, regarding TB. They already allocated money and so on and so on. So if, you, uh, if we find out you have TB and you didn't go to the health center, I'm going to put you in jail. parang Duterte type. So uh, that is a motivation for him to. Meron siyang maibibigay na, what do you call, uh, a motivation. Why should I invest in TB control? Because of the understanding of the spillover effects, the uh, externalities involved. Now, I was thinking about nutrition. So how does one, if we want to communicate the importance of stunting, how can we make that uh, human capital index into a communication strategy by saying that if you invest in stunting prevention now, we are actually doing something in the future of your constituency regarding uh, uh, child mortality and child morbidity, regarding uh, 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 performance in the schooling of their children and future productivity. But those are all in the future. You might not be mayor anymore. You might not see these people anymore. But how can we make it visualize for him and for the constituency that these are real uh, outcomes and we discount it. So if he can communicate to his constituency, alam mo, yung ating ginawa ngayon na for stunting prevention, yung ordinance natin sa Sangunian, yung budget natin para dyan, wala na ako mamaya. Pero alam nyo ba na yung nakakaano yan sa mga bata natin? Nakakaano yan sa pag-eskwela ng mga bata at saka marireduce yung poverty ng future families and so on. Eh, ginawa natin yan ngayon, di ba? So, parang, parang, uh, hindi ko ma, I cannot uh, fully uh, articulate it, but ganun siguro yung message that you make them understand the importance and the future consequences of that action and then make it such that siya yung gumawa nun, maski hindi pa nakikita yung outcomes. So that is his political capital. Parang, no, he gets excited. Ako pala, maski wala ako, alam ko mangyayari yun. At matatandaan ninyo ako 10 years, 20 years from now. Thank you, Dr. Hiring. Dr. Albert, um, your thoughts on the MNE of rural poverty? Well, definitely, I think the, the, the problem that we have right now is we have all of these programs, some with very big budgets, humongous budgets, could be AFMA, but results have not been quite uh, desirable. <laughs> to be, I mean, we haven't seen as much results as, as we would have wanted. But I think the question in here is that why didn't we not put in accountability frameworks from the very start? Uh, if we know that we're upscaling budgets from one million and then all of a sudden it becomes a billion you know, or something like that, I mean, in a way, it, it, it goes back to us because, in a way, you're in Congress, so I know. <laughs> so you, there, there might be some realities that you work with, but uh, 
but I think the, 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 the difficulty that we have is that we've, we've also, in a way, not considered the, the perspective of our legislators and, and politicians that they, that they really, in a way, are limited by the, our perspe their perspectives of three years, six years, terms, whereas those of us in the public service who, who have tenure, once you get tenure, you stay here forever, you know, unless you're kicked out <laughs> in some way or another. So, question is, how do we affect better partnerships? I mean, that, that I think is one of the things about now uh, an ecosystem approach, that we have to recognize the varying actors, but because there needs to be leaders, there also need to recognize that there are different capacities, individual and institutional capacities. S uh, how do we strengthen this? Part of it is M&E, but then even if you have the best m and &E system, but then you show some m and &E outputs, but what will happen if the institution itself is not willing to, to see this data and, and make changes in its programs because of the results of m and &E. I often say, in fact, because, you know, PIDs, we do a lots of evaluations. Uh, next, perhaps, to auditors, we're among the least liked because as evaluators, we will tell you uh, certain things that you do not like to see. But then the problem now is, as far as institutions, sometimes they themselves wouldn't like to be evaluated because, especially by external evaluators, because they're, 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 again, that issue of accountability. Now they may get lo lower budgets. Uh, so what do we do? I mean, we really need to have to, to work, get, get our act together because uh, while to some extent there have been some positive outcomes, but we could really work better together to make this a much better country. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon po. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Albert and Dr. Herin, for that very valuable and useful uh, information that you have delivered to us. Uh, I am from Emelda Angeles Abdepa. I'm from the Food and Nutrition Research Institute, Department of Science and Technology. Kami po yung nagkakandak po ng National Nutrition Survey. Uh, so, uh, I just have uh, clarifications or maybe uh, comments uh, for uh, Dr. Herin. Uh, if you think of missing link, uh, is, it is actually, you have presented to us the various or numerous interventions deployed to uh, by the Department of Health and other institutions down the ground. But I think uh, the missing link in there is actually the timing of intervention, the frequency, and the duration as well as the quality of nutrition intervention that is actually given to the grassroots. But in all of this, to sum up, is there really a manpower capable to carry out all these services at the ground? We keep on talking about malnutrition, about nutritional problems, and so on. But where is the nutritionist at the health facility? There is none. And who is the most capable person to actually handle and do some sort of nutrition education to the populace? Nobody. Is it the nurse? Is it the midwife? Or is it the doctor? So I think we have been in discussion with the National Nutrition Council to put forward and enhance the PD that is actually encouraging LGUs to employ nutritionists at the ground. And I also have this taken into consideration by the Department of Health. I hope uh, that would be actually uh, inputted into the missing link. <laughs> and um, we keep on actually telling um, convergence of resources at the local level. So nice to be said, but even at the national level, is there convergence of resources among the NNC governing board or NNC technical committees because after the PIPAN what for no after the Philippine plan of action for nutrition is developed 
how does it penetrate the ground? They do their own municipal development action plans. But who cares? Are these capable persons in doing the plan of the municipality really capable to actually see the different looks or faces of the problems in the municipality if they are not actually trained? We have a lot of training resources, finances, and so on. It's there. But the quality of of training that we are imparting to them, is it really that kind of needs at the girls, as at the grassroots? So, uh, ito po lang yung medyo maishishare ko po ngayon because I'm so passionate because we are already old in the, old in the <laughs> service as nutritionist dietitians until now. When I enter government service, malnutrition is the problem. Magre-retire na po ako. Nutrition, malnutrition pa rin ang problema. Uh, but then, uh, when we presented our 2018 National Nutrition Survey results, I think us, what does our data say? Are we in or out in the SDG targets? And that was my last slide, and I actually throw that to the crowd. And the crowd says, we are down. And therefore, we are actually, inaamin po natin, na hindi po tayo talaga masyadong nagtatrabaho. Maraming salamat po. <laughs> Maraming salamat po, ma'am. Dr. Herin, your, uh, your yeah. comments. Well, I appreciate that uh, uh, comment. Uh, actually, uh, an identification of a really important resource at the local level. I think that was discussed um, several times, especially at DOH, where you know, may, the, there's a request for all of this uh, uh, their deployment program that have been going on for years. First, of course, it's not just nutritionists that are lacking, but uh, even municipalities don't have doctors, so that's why they had doctors to the barrios. Um, then uh, they said that oh, they, we don't have enough uh, people to help out the midwives because uh, they cannot. Uh, local governments cannot hire more midwives because of the uh, personal service cap, uh, salary cap, or whatever. Uh, so they uh, hired uh, not necessarily midwives first, but nurses, uh, and then later on several. Pero hindi pa yata nakarating dun sa nutritionist. And I think in the last deployment program, I don't think the nutritionist uh, was uh, included yet there. But uh, that uh, that. Um, I think it's important, especially as you mentioned, when we get down to the municipal level, the municipal nutrition action officer may not be really qualified to, uh, to oversee the nutrition program in that municipality in behalf, of the, in, the, in behalf of the mayor or in behalf of the local health sector as such. And actually, they have many different qualifications, and they come from many different kinds of offices. And um, even coordinating can be a problem because you can, it's hard to coordinate another office if you come from another office and so on. It's probably better if you are under the office of the mayor, then you can use the mayor's uh, name and so on. But even then, uh, if you are not uh, technically competent to oversee this program, then what will happen is just be collecting reports. And I think sometimes that's what uh, they might be able to do, collect the OPT reports and then report it up, up there uh, and so on. So uh, yeah, I, I, will, I will support that. But, you, but we come up with a, a bigger problem, and that is the capacity of local government to actually hire more people uh, to uh, not just for nutritionists, but for the other health uh, components. As one said in, uh, in a workshop, uh, ang problema natin, uh, lumalaki yung population, pero walang tao. What? <laughs> so he means that, uh, well, uh, uh, population is growing, but uh, local governments cannot actually hire more people based on their era because of the uh, cap on the personal services and so on. So uh, again, when we were talking about maybe the 
Docker government code, which would have been reviewed every five years, which has never been reviewed, as you mentioned, needs to be reviewed. And one of that component is the, uh, to review, if you want to keep the same structure, but to uh, more or less uh, have greater flexibility in local governments to actually hire more people according to the demand or needs. Uh, of course, I think the reason why they put a cap is that they don't want local governments to just spend all of their money just hiring more people. But then there's also a downside to that, as we are beginning to see now. Thank you, Dr. Hirin. Yes, for the last question, ma'am. Hello, I'm from Council for the Welfare of Children. I'm uh, Maria Edna Estal. I'm part of our localization and institutionalization uh, service for the children and for the partners. Uh, I think uh, I would like first, before my uh, concern or uh, question for Dr. Herrin about nutrition, uh, I would like to share the initiative of the Council for the Welfare of Children as uh, it seems that somebody here or some of our uh, colleagues here or friends are interested on in how to uh, involve the LGUs in addressing the problems on nutrition, specifically regarding uh, uh, the pressing uh, concerns like about the stunting, the overweight, and the uh, other uh, problems on nutrition. Uh, we have here the initiative of CWC. We have the child-friendly local governance, wherein uh, we establish on how to incentivize the LGUs in uh, uh, giving uh, positive results for our children involving nutrition because we have a list of indicators addressing the problems, not only on nutrition, we also have for the special protection, but I would like to focus on nutrition. Some of the indicators as stipulated in the indicator system of the child-friendly local governance, because we have this uh, presidential award on child-friendly cities and municipalities, and the baseline of that is the CFLGA, which is the child-friendly local governance audit, spearheaded by the ILG, and the CWC conferred the, the child-friendly uh, LGUs through the seal of child-friendly local governance. So uh, the CFLGA and then the SCFLGA uh, are the prerequisite to have the award for the presidential award on child-friendly LGUs. So uh, one of the members of the National Advisory Committee is the NNC, wherein they define the uh, the the meaning of stunting and then uh, I think uh, another one is about the overweight and then also the 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 wasting. So they have good definitions for that in a consultation with the different partners, not only at the regional level but also at the local level. So through that uh, kind of system, uh, we would like to establish a. Uh, child-friendly local governance wherein they can address problems on nutrition. So that is the idea uh, regarding the, the concern of CWC because uh, the LGUs are not zero in understanding the, the, key, the key words for the nutrition as mentioned a while ago. And my, uh, my point now or the concern is I would like to uh, raise the concern about the uh, participation of our business sector in addressing the problems on nutrition. So I would like to know how can we engage the business sector to help the government in addressing nutrition because they have the corporate social responsibility. So can we have uh, this, uh, this result or the findings are very uh, helpful in terms of uh, showing what kind of nutrition that we have for our Filipino children. So if we have this business, business sector, I think we can uh, 
we can present the, the findings for them to think about the program so that they can help the government. So for the side po ni Dr. Herin, siguro uh, maganda na marinig din natin paano yung thinking or perspective on how to involve the business sector for the nutrition program. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Herin, please. Well, uh, what uh, we, we probably want uh, for, let's say, business or other, even the uh, NGOs, CSOs participation, is uh, we want their participation to eventually uh, grow in a scale that could make a difference. So we might have a business establishment who have this little program here or CSO, a little program there, and so on. While they are good and uh, welcome, it, does, it might not necessarily add up to, uh, uh, to get at the results we want at the national level uh, to achieve targets and so on. So I was thinking that uh, uh, in many cases where we don't involve the private sector, there's always this feeling that, uh, well, the public sector can do a better job especially in, in the health sector or TB control or something like that. And uh, while there has been suggestions about uh, public-private partnership, sometimes it's difficult to uh, get it again at scale at the, at the for health and nutrition. But that might be a way to go um, in, in relation to the recently passed uh, universal health care law where um, it addresses part of the fragmentation of the local government. Uh, they now want to have uh, a province-wide health system, uh, city-wide for the uh, urbanized cities. So uh, it's still difficult for me to see how they're going to do that in the context of the local government code. But at least you uh, defragmentize a large part. And how do you finance the delivery of services for that? And one of the suggestion is, uh, for the pool of funds that is pooled, let's say, in PhilHealth, to actually outsource or uh, um, contract out a set of services to uh, either the uh, local government who form themselves into a network or a private sector who can form themselves into a network. So it's like uh, buying services from a uh, private sector who can form a network that will provide services. And that can be applied to nutrition. So one could say that uh, for this municipality, all the nutrition sets of activities, who, who wants to bid for this? Uh, we have some idea of how much it would cost to reach all of these families and so on, and who will bid? So uh, private groups, whether it's uh, uh, businesses, uh, commercial businesses or CSOs and so on, might, uh, might use that as an opportunity to both serve as well as be financed uh, for the services that they will provide. And, th and that might be one way to go about it in, uh, in a more organized way, in a, in a large scale way, so that we can have some impact. Uh, so it's a, that's something that uh, we, w we would want to uh, follow through as they develop the uh, IRR of the universal health coverage and how DOH and PhilHealth actually uh, craft this particular set of uh, intervention. But going back to the LGU, uh, the, this, this need that was uh, mentioned earlier, that maybe we should take a look at the local government code again and see where it might be amended. If we look at the more recent laws, it's national in scope, and it always assigns accountability to the Department of Health, for example, in health. And then we just uh, mentioned a little bit that, oh, they should also engage the LGUs and the uh, business uh, sector. So, hihintay na lang ba yung LGUs? Uh, I know it's a national law, but can in the national law says, this is what we need to accomplish. This is uh, uh, DOH, LGUs, these are your specific function and you're accountable for the results. Uh, and for example, in the 
local government code, all it says is that in the devolved health service, uh, municipalities, for example, you should provide maternal and child care, uh, you should provide family planning services. Well, it's uh, very general, but uh, things have changed. There's a whole set of interventions related to uh, maternal and child care, a whole set of ways of providing family planning services, new guidelines, and so on. But those guidelines are just for them to consider. It's not uh, a requirement that these are the guidelines that they should follow and this is the amount of uh, investments they should need because they're, they're autonomous, they can choose not to. Uh, for a case of family planning, for example, or even nutrition, they say, well, I'm supposed to do that. Okay, I will do that. I will have a uh, uh, midwife who sits in the rural health center. So if you want consultation on family planning, you go there. That's my family planning program. Or uh, nutrition, yeah, well, we have uh, nutrition scholars that would measure, and again, we have that midwife. If you go for prenatal care, it gives you nutrition education, nutrition counseling, and so on. That's my nutrition program. Or better, better yet, I, I have a program that uh, helps out uh, school feeding program. That's more visible, more politically acceptable for me, and so on. So, but it doesn't, it, it just do piecemeal what, what would be a total set of interventions. So is there a way by which the national law can also strengthen that part which says, we know in the local government code, we told you to do this, that's your responsibility. But under this new law, that responsibility means this. And so you detailed out uh, what those sets of intervention that should go into what should be a nutrition intervention, what should be a, a family planning or maternal child care nutrition intervention and so on, and specify it. And so that, uh, I don't know legally whether that supersedes the local government code. So uh, that, that's probably where uh, some discussions on whether we can have a national law that specifies uh, what needs to be done to achieve certain goals. And then that this is also clearly a responsibility of the local government under the uh, local government code uh, and so on. And not just be said that the DOH will enjoin the uh, local government or engage, the, of course you engage them, but then they say no, I have priorities, uh, I, I am autonomous, uh, I have my era, I can, I'm supposed to be spending that whatever I want. So. And there are 2,000 of them saying <laughs> all that. So how do you get scale of uh, operations and uh, things like that? Not to mention <coughs> not only the missing links that I mentioned, but uh, the missing links that uh, was mentioned by uh, Dr. Adepa. The timing of it, the uh, frequency, the duration. In other words, in uh, medical terms, the dosage. So we might be doing something, but first of all, it's the wrong medicine. Uh, too late, or the dosage is not enough. In, in, it's not enough. Lang, not the full dosage. Otherwise, baka ma, ano yung, if, kung antibiotic pa, ma resistant <laughs> because of the uh, low dosage. So that's a, those are some of the insights I get from your questions. So I, I, I thank you very much uh, for, for those. Thank you, Dr. Hirin. Much as we want to heal, hear your, all your questions and comments, we, we regret to inform you that we are already uh, beyond our time. But uh, you may want to approach. Ah, you have one question, sir. Okay. One last question for uh, our friend from UNICEF. Hi, I'm with UNICEF. Uh, I'm a nutritionist. I work for the nutrition team. Uh, thank you both, Dr. Albert and Dr. Hirin. Um, so I've tried to listen carefully to both of your presentations, um, and I have one. I think I have lots of uh, comments, but I have one question on where do you see uh, the work that you do on analyzing the data on who's poor and who's not poor, and how, uh, I mean, my question is, how do you see your work being combined? Like, you've both done an analysis on poverty and stunting, but then how and where do they interact, uh, 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 and how would you formulate uh, uh, recommendations? Um, because stunting is, is only one indicator and poverty is very much 
um, as we know, is one of the underlying causes of, of stunting. And I think that's why uh, um, we are partly here. Uh, so my question would be how do you, you know, how, if you would look at both your presentations, how would you combine them and how would you recommend uh, ways forward? Thank you. Thank you so much. We start with Dr. Albert. Well, the SDGs already sort of suggested that, you know, there are complement, there are linkages across goals. Uh, clearly, whether it's health, you know, gender, um, disa climate and disasters and, and poverty and what have you, they're all like linked together. But unfortunately, sometimes we tend to have like uh, piecemeal approaches, each thing, you know, we, I, I, I looked at one thing, Alex looked at another. Uh, but even as far as policies and programs are concerned, they, they tend to be very disconnected. I, I kept saying this over and over again. Unfortunately, right now, I don't think there is a mechanism for doing something like a, a whole of government approach to doing things. Uh, whether, you know, and by whole of government, it's really a public sector management approach to making sure that you have all of this interlocking. Uh, I mean, right, we, we, I mean, when I compare Philippines with many other countries I've been to and I've worked in, I know that coordination happens. But whether that coordination translates into something, act, into a real action and a real outcome is another thing altogether. We, kept, we keep meeting, we have sometimes three, four meetings in a day. Uh, but, you know, I mean, you cannot solve problems with meetings, you know? Uh, you, may, you, you, may, you may have meetings where you advocate certain and say these are the problems, say let's do something, you know. And I think this is one of the reasons why the president continues to be very popular because he has been considered from a perspective that, you know, he delivers rather, whether, whether you agree with it or not. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's a matter of opinion, but I think the, the point here is that uh, he's perceived that something happens. <laughs> Uh, uh, where, uh, but and, and I think this is where we need to start reflecting also. I mean, uh, Imelda was pointing out that she's been here for, for in the public sector for, uh, for how many decades, uh, and she's about to retire, and, and malnutrition persists. But the question is why? I mean, uh, so it's really high time that maybe we may have been doing so many things, but at the end of the day, they have not really resulted to, to real outcomes. So part of it is each one has to do our own little thing. Here we at PIBS, we do evaluations. We try our best to do it, but we cannot evaluate everything because there are only a few handful of us here and we don't have enough resources to do all the kinds of evaluations we'd like to do. Uh, you know, I, but I leave the, the rest of the opinions to-, to Dr. Helen, to, to please. Yeah, I just did uh, some estimates. I, I put together the <coughs> per capita health, nutrition, population expenditures of local governments. So the, the province, because they separate city and municipality, because I could have to combine them at the province level, because I only have province level uh, data on stunting and poverty rates poverty incidents. So I just did a uh, simple uh, regression, and what I find is very significant uh, effect of poverty. So the higher the poverty of the province, uh, higher the stunting rates as well. But there's no s relationship at all when it came to the per capita uh, local government expenditures on health nutrition. So it, it appears to me that uh, all of the uh, underlying determinants of stunting, the income, the environment, the access to food, and all of those are really important. Uh, but also important are the direct interventions. But unfortunately, in this particular case, those interventions do not seem to yield any effect. And it could be because uh, they are not focused specifically on actual population, on actual interventions. And all the missing links that I mentioned, plus what uh, Dr. Agdapa mentioned, the timing, the frequency, the dosage, the quality, and so on, and all the other inputs. So 
it looks like local government expenditure might be done at random. So that uh, they, they have uh, no effects. So maybe while the other uh, policy managers are working on how to reduce poverty and uh, provide more uh, uh, access to food, uh, quality food, uh, through various kinds of interventions and so on, we should also begin to look at more carefully at the local level uh, the direct interventions and see uh, how do we organize it in such a way that uh, the expenditures that uh, are uh, provided by local government would actually have an impact. And that's where we can provide guidelines to the local governments on exactly what needs to be done uh, and how to do it uh, in the timing, frequency, duration, quality that we need uh, to do it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hirin. So that concludes our uh, forum uh, this afternoon. And we would like to thank our speakers for their insights and for the active participation of our audience. Uh, good afternoon and see you all in our forthcoming activities. <laughs>